workshop this afternoon. Um, and I mean, I suppose first question really is why are we doing this? I mean, I think there's a number of reasons, but um, it, throughout our challenge of battling infectious diseases, I think there's often been a neglect of diagnostics as a whole in terms of the response. I, I remember a conversation probably 10 years ago now with Peter Peart, who used to run UNAIDS, who was reflecting on the fact that it took the world, the global HIV response quite a long time to get to grips with the importance of diagnostics. And, and there've been a lot of emphasis on treatment and, and prevention, and sometimes diagnostics has got forgotten. And of course, in the last two or three years, that's changed quite a lot. And there's a moment where diagnostics has been in the spotlight. Uh, and it's important that we, we capitalize on that to make sure that the progress that has been achieved is carried on. And I think what we have seen in the UK and beyond is a huge amount of innovation. So early on, there were some clearly some failures. And, and when we looked at the COVID response, diagnostics were lacking early on. Some of them didn't work as well as we would wish. And that took a while to get rectified. But we also saw tremendous innovation in from small companies, from larger companies. Uh, and I think we've seen a huge amount of progress in the last couple of years, um, not just in technology, but also in some of the systems. Uh, and of course, innovative ways of using diagnostics with home self-sampling and so forth. And the relevance of this, I think, will be important, not just for COVID, but for other, other infectious diseases going forward. And we'll hear a bit today about some examples that go beyond uh, COVID, particularly thinking about sepsis, flu, and, and other conditions like CMV, which we'll hear about. So what do we want to get out of this? I think the main purpose here is, is really to share information, to, to raise awareness of what's going on, um, and really to encourage conversations between potential collaborators, be they academic, be they industrial, um, be they in, in other sectors. So uh, hopefully people will make connections through this and follow up on them. Um, but also for us to listen and to listen to people who think that there should be more support in certain areas, where there should be more work in certain areas uh, and so forth. So um, I'm very grateful for the London MedTech IVD for pulling this together, um, directed by George Hanna and, and Noka for all her organisation. Thank you for, for herding, the, herding the cats on this. Um, and so what we've got this afternoon is quite a broad agenda. Hopefully um, there'll be something of interest to, to, to most people. They're quite short talks, so I would encourage people to be brief if they can. We'll try and squeeze some questions in, but I'm going to be a very strict chair and try and keep us to time. Um, so at least we have some time for discussion at the end, but we'll try and get a couple of short ones in if we can between talks, I think. Um, there is some housekeeping. I think if you're not talking, if you could mute uh, and probably put your cameras off until you're on. If you're asking a question, please try and get your cameras on. Uh, and this is being recorded. So um, we, without any further ado, I think it's probably good just to start. And so our first talk is going to be from Omar Butt who um, I didn't realize got a very grand title there, Omar. So oh, don't, gosh. No, <laughs> don't, please don't read that out. No, that's self-imposed. No, I, I, I insist because it's so important. So, so Global <laughs> Strategic Development Lead for Health Innovation at the London IVD. And I don't know if you're going to talk a bit more about the IVD and what it does. Yes. Um, but I can also add to that. So so over to you. And th thanks Thank for your, you very much. For your time. Thank you, Graham, for that introduction. That's very kind of you. Actually, let me just make sure I share the right screen. Excuse me. Um, what I'd like to do is just pick up essentially where Graham left off, um, as well as this being an opportunity to discuss how we tackle this uh, concept of infectious diseases, um, we want to, I want to add a, a slightly different lens or an angle on this um, in, in that I want to focus slightly on the end of the journey um, for, for innovators in particular, those that are developing novel diagnostics or therapeutics, whatever the case may be, it often comes time that we have to demonstrate our value to our, for want of a better phrase, potential customer or user. And I think I'd just like to add to all of today's talks, a frame of reference and context around the type of work that London IVD does and how it supports ultimately with that final discussion um, at commissioning level or, or with infectious diseases in particular with charities or developing economies in the um, in, in, develop, in, in the developing world. So um, I will move on through these slides and at the end we should have some quick questions but basic context for today is that um, I'm going to talk through what we do uh, or what London IVD is, um, how we support innovators, the work that we do, I'm going to talk through a rapid case study just to put some, some meat on the bones as to how we do 
help innovators reach that what we refer to as value proposition as part of their sort of translational piece of work between from bench to bedside as they say uh, and then a bit about how we work with individuals and collaborate with them so again just a lens with which you can examine all of today's uh, talks so let's just get this into presentation mode and off we go can somebody tell me I think I'm sharing the wrong one. Let's do that. Is that the right one that I'm sharing for you now? I hope so. We just got. We can see your next slide. That's all. You're on the presenter view. Oh, the presenter one. view. Fab. Let me just swap back. I can't see any faces uh, now on the normal yeah, view. Yeah, that's that's the way. Yeah. That's the right Thank one. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, London In Vitro Diagnostic Centre, part of um, the MIC cooperative group um, eight of us up and down the country um, set up by the NIHR to uh, support academic and industry researchers in medtech development generating the right evidence uh, to enable most importantly the adoption of diagnostic devices into the NHS and I think um, historically we look at adoption criteria being based predominantly on clinical um, um, uh, what's the word, clinical markers in a way, uh, and also potentially health economic evidence. But I want to exaggerate a, a component of what we offer at London IVD, um, which is the human factors evidence that also supplements this and moves us away from some of the pain points we typically feel when we go to market. Um, our research is um, not just, our, our unit is not just there to deliver evaluation, we're also focused on developing novel research techniques or evaluation techniques, which means that it, it puts us at the cutting edge, I suppose, of the way in which we assess the impact of technology on, ad, on a various systems, which in, in today's sort of context means we can generate evidence for evaluation as close to the real world implications or impact of deploying a technology as possible, which is useful for multiple reasons, both in terms of product development, but also in terms of understanding how we position and propose our technology to health systems. A quick note on our leads, of course, from the methodological perspective, you'll see uh, Prof Pete Buckle and Dr Melody Nee. Uh, you'll all be familiar, I'm sure, with Prof George Hanna, who leads the clinical theme, and from a technology perspective, perspective of course, Molly Stevens, Tony Cass, uh, and Chris uh, Tumazel. So, how we support? Typically, we engage with uh, a, a, a spectrum of innovators from industry, early career researchers, uh, and even those from, uh, I suppose, the, a clinical background and a clinical field. And we often are approached for support in accessing health systems for product design and evaluation, support with funding applications to research pots or to, to grant pots, access to PPI representatives, of course. Um, today, I want to focus particularly on our support around value proposition development and, of course, the underlying sort of foundation of that the evidence we generate to support those value propositions, as well as market analysis and needs identification and specification for novel technologies. Um, why do we offer this support? Well, because as well as that sort of journey of developing a product being so complicated, we find selling or getting adoption for a product is, is probably equally as complicated in the complex systems that are our our health providers these days or or the emerging economies that infectious diseases diagnostics might be focused at we're typically never selling to an individual stakeholder we're selling to multiple typically with conflicting agendas or perverse incentives and um the the i suppose the the focus of of years of effort in developing a product often leaves us um in a position, I suppose, a naive position of how we engage or how we communicate with these stakeholders um, in a language that they can understand. So today we're going to shed some light on the strategies uh, and supporting evidence you might use or employ to make your product stand out and how you can communicate this with those individuals. And of course, we'll focus on infectious diseases and how we can um, support those in, in those non-standard health system environments. Our work is underpinned by, uh, I suppose, a series of core skill sets, predominantly 
health economics, human factors, uh, patient and public involvement. We also, as mentioned, sort of focus a lot around the adoption of, of, um, uh, of technology and support with clinical studies, data science and laboratory validation as well. To supplement all of this and to, um, to add another bow to the offer, um, we also translate this capability into education, both for the health system and for industry. Um, and often deliver this in the form of accelerators and so on. And this is this is our uh, um, skill set enabling individuals to go and assess and validate technology from a healthcare perspective, or helping industry understand the type of roadmap or the type of journey they're going to go on in order to generate the right type of evidence to support you know the mass development of innovation um, and something that will continue on with us into the future. So a quick case study and the main point of today's talk, so I finish with plenty of time. What is a value proposition to start with and, and how is this supported by London IBD? So a value proposition in, in old language, I suppose, would have been a sales pitch, but actually it's it's more complicated than that as, as uh, adoption within health systems has become more complicated because of the multiple stakeholders we need to address. We need to be thinking as value. We need to be thinking of value propositions as the link between the features and benefits of a product to an individual's value that is impacted by the adoption of your technology. Typically, we can have we can examine who's impacted by a technology by mapping out a patient or a workflow pathway that is augmented or or changed by your technology and understanding how that change affects an individual's uh, engagement with that workflow process and perhaps and more importantly identifying why, why they may be rude to it and that often takes two distinct categories either system incentive dissuades them from supporting the adoption of your technology or an individual very emotional incentive often linked to anxiety and stress from a healthcare provider perspective um, prevents individuals from uh, supporting the adoption of a technology. So when we go about generating evidence or when we generate a value proposition, what we want to do is demonstrate to individuals in multiple languages um, using appropriate evidence why a technology is beneficial to them and we want to alleviate any fears or inform the health system of any pinch points that might be created by a novel intervention so that may that excuse me so that they may plan mitigating strategies in order to avoid any i suppose conflict or any uh, pinch points that might arise typically the evidence that we generate in order to create value propositions or the three types of value propositions that we want to create fall under three buckets of, of evidence, if you want. Clinical evidence, which we're fairly familiar with, of course, the financial evidence, and the human factors evidence. Clinical evidence, of course, extremely important for the patient, for the clinician, and for the whole system. Financial evidence, often very much needed, of course, by those paying for the, uh, for the intervention but actually good practice in terms of demonstrating real value to multiple stakeholders. And human factors evidence, again, broad set of stakeholders, often those that aren't the user beneficiary or payer of a product that need some reassurance that their, um, I suppose their day-to-day -day won't change too much. Um, this activity or this, this use of um, evidence to create a pyramid or, or a foundation to the value propositions that we deliver often sees us being more sophisticated as an innovator in the way that we propose our product, shifting our sales pitch or our value proposition away from just system alignment, i.e. we've designed something to tackle COVID, to being very focused on individually aligned uh, uh, value propositions whereby we can start talking about efficiency savings and, and reduction in terms of operational costs and expenditures and efficiencies on a health system and therefore the positive impact that might have uh, on an individual. It's important at this point to point out uh, what happens if you don't generate this evidence or that you're not as robust as you could be with it. Well, what we see from 
industry and those that try to tackle the adoption challenge without supporting evidence is that there is a very long sales cycle and a very long engagement with the health system that doesn't often result in success. We see organisations taking 18 months to two and a half years to build relationships within a very discrete area of a health system um, that may eventually result in a, um, in a in a sale or the product being adopted, but we don't see that operating at scale. And we see a lot of companies falling by the wayside as part of that. Um, to validate any claim or any value proposition, of course, you want evidence. Um, why do you go agnostically or why do you, do you move out of house to generate that evidence? A lot of very capable innovators are, are of course, more than capable of developing their own evidence it is something to do with trust and it is something to do with having an agnostic third party generate your evidence knowing that uh, both the positives and the negatives around the adoption of a product might be or will be documented and i believe you know the health system looks upon that more favorably than evidence generated in in-house uh, and when should you start when should you engage with generating evidence well I, I think at the at the at the point in which you've conceived an idea is the perfect place to start but it's also never too late um the the process you go for in validating a product clinically financially and from a human factors perspective doesn't just help you sell your product or have it adopted it also informs the way the product is designed by getting feedback from the health system as part of your journey and the individuals impacted by the product, you're able to augment it and I suppose um, create the, the, the best or the most well aligned product to the, the need or the problem. That you're... Um, sorry, Omar. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. Ah, no, sorry. Um, I, I wasn't sure um, if the slide uh, was at the correct uh, point, uh, but uh, fine. yeah. Yeah, great. Sorry about that, Omar. Please no go ahead. Thank you. No, thanks, Naoko. So just a little word on how we work together. Um, uh, well, we work with innovators from a diverse set of professional backgrounds, uh, you know, from SMEs, from, from clinical backgrounds, from uh, early career researchers in, in, in uh, scientific institutes and who have a varying degree of available resources uh, and experience. And uh, ultimately, what we say is that it's, you know, it's always... It's, always appropriate to have a chat to start and it's it's never too late in a way um, reach out we have to be very um, bespoke with the way that we engage because of the vast uh, array of difference between innovations so how do we work best thing to do is have a chat to get started and see if we can identify some some areas that we can work together uh, and then build from there there is of course no commitment to have a chat uh, at any point um typically of course it gets to a stage in which we need to understand um how these types of um, engagements are funded and and it's always a question that comes up so a quick slide here on the fact that we um we can uh, help you apply for funding schemes or, or uh, can support any self-funded organizations um as well in developing their evidence to help well, what we might refer to as that market access strategy and that final hurdle in, in the long journey of having your product developed uh, and then finally getting it to market without you know, the, the hurdles that most of us face in doing that. And our objective, of course, is to, to try and get as many products in the hands of the, of the patients and benefiting from them um, as soon as possible without them falling by the wayside in that one and a half, two year gap where, um, where often technology falls off when it's not supported by the right evidence. So at that point, I hope I stuck to reasonably good timing, Graham. I hope I covered that all well, pretty quickly and it made enough sense. Uh, again, it was a lens for today. Um, feel just wanted to sort of use it as an opportunity, set some frameworks for those of you that want to engage and ask any questions but also understand how the evidence that um, the, the next speakers are going to be talking about could be used in order to support some of those value propositions going forward. Thank you. That's great. No, thank you very much. I think I think that's a really helpful overview of the sort of work that the MedTech IVD can do. And um, I don't know if anybody has any questions or questions for clarification at this point. If you do, just either put them in the chat or put your hand up. I've seen one camera come on, which suggests that someone may, may be keen. Well, it's gone there, run away. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, 
but and if not, then Anka, if you could start to get your slides ready, I think we'll, we'll just go on. And um, I th so what we've heard is, is 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 some of the framework that the is on offer and and some of the ways of approaching. And I think we'll have a couple of talks later which show some more examples of the work of the IBD group. Um, Anka's going to talk about something related but not directly related, which which is much more about the assessing the clinical impact. And I think one of the areas. That personally I'm very interested in and I think that as, as a group we're interested in from an academic perspective is how we how we look at the real clinical impact of a diagnostic which is actually quite an interesting complicated problem so Anka's going to give us one, uh, one example of, of some work that he's done um, Anka's a uh, academic clinical lecturer based at UCL currently who's worked very closely with us in a number of things including COVID and um, I'll let you take over Anka and tell us about this particular project. Uh, thanks Graham and, and thanks for inviting me to to come and speak. Um, so yeah, I'm going to sort of address the question of whether diagnostics can improve patient outcomes, um, thinking about how we translate infectious diseases um, diagnostics, um, and using the case study of, of rapid diagnostics for, for TB. Um, so I'll go through a bit of background briefly that's relevant to, to TB, um, then I'll talk mostly about urine diagnostics for HIV-associated TB um, as, a, as a case study. And then briefly at the end, I'm going to talk about the R2D2 TB network, which I'm involved in, um, which is trying to advance um, TB diagnostics. Um, so TB remains a major cause of morbidity and mortality. It's still one of the, the top 10 killers globally. Um, and despite the, um, the challenges of, of COVID-19, which increased TB related deaths and um, provided even more challenges to diagnosis, we were actually failing to meet TB elimination targets um, even prior to COVID-19. And what's really important about TB is the diagnostics gap is, is immense. So um, about 40% of, of, of estimated prevalence cases or up to 40% on don't reach the, the stage of diagnosis, um, which is why diagnostics can have um, potential uh, real impact in, in TB. Um, so TB is really hard to diagnose in, its, in itself. Um, the illness that TB causes is very nonspecific. Um, the bacteria itself, it's got a thick cell wall. It grows slowly in culture. Um, TB most commonly affects the lungs and there's real challenges in getting sputum samples to which we use to diagnose TB. Um, and it's even harder in the context of, of HIV. Um, HIV is, uh, um, causes immune suppression um, and it's strongly correlated with um, with TB um, and patients who are HIV positive often don't get the host immune responses that lead to tissue destruction and TB bacilli entering the sputum which is how we often diagnose it. Um, the consequences of missing TB are also much higher in, in HIV positive patients. So TB is responsible for a quarter of admissions to hospital um, and a quarter of deaths in high HIV burden countries in Africa and when we look at post-mortem studies we found uh, TB in almost half of, of patients who died, and, and almost half of that was, was undiagnosed at the, the time of death. Um, if we look at all of this evidence together, there's a clear need for better TB diagnostics and a sort of new diagnostic approach, and there's a real potential to try and improve patient outcomes. Um, so moving on to, to urine diagnostics, how can we diagnose TB from, from urine? Um, so we can detect um, TB antigens directly in the urine, um, Lipoarabinomanan, or, or LAM for short, is a cell wall glycolipid, and it's a major constituent of, of the TB cell wall. And it was back in the 90s that people noticed that you could detect LAM in the urine of patients who, who had TB. Um, however, it, it took till 2013 before ALIA developed this um, lateral flow assay for LAM. Um, it just requires 60 microliters of, of urine. Um, and it gives a result after, after 25 minutes. Um, one of the challenges is that the urine lamb detection, it, it's not very sensitive in the, in the general population when you're trying to diagnose TB, but some of the early studies uh, incidentally noted actually, it was more sensitive in um, patients who are HIV positive. Um, so, so that sort of developed a new use case for, for this test. We can also um, detect TB from urine using PCR, uh, and I'm sure many of the audience members are familiar with Kefid's Gene Expert platform. This is a um, semi-automated um, near patient platform for, for rapid um, PCR. And their TB assay called the Expert MTB RIF um, was endorsed by WHO back in, in 2010 for the use on sputum with the HIV positive population being sort of a key target group. 
Um, we found that if you take urine um, and spin it down with the centrifuge and you pop the pellet in a gene expert cartridge, you can also detect um, TB. So how accurate is urine lamb for, for HIV associated TB? As I said, in, in HIV negative patients, the sensitivity is, is quite poor really, only 10 to 20% of TB patients can be picked up with urine lamb testing. However, in HIV positive patients, particularly in the sicker patients, so these are patients admitted to hospital, the sensitivity is, is moderate, um, around sort of 40 to 50%. Um, and the, the lamb test has good specificity generally, um, studies that have a, a more robust reference standard um, tend to show higher specificities. So we, we, we had an idea of, of how accurate it was, um, but we wanted to try and understand whether um, using urine diagnostics could improve TB diagnosis. Um, so we did a, a clinical study in, in that group that we thought would benefit most. So um, HIV positive patients who were admitted to um, hospital. Um, we did this study in, in Cape Town in South Africa which is a, a population with particularly high rates of both TB and HIV. Um, and we tried to recruit patients who were admitted to hospital. Um, and we wanted to compare how well the urine test did to sputum tests. But we also wanted to try and diagnose as much TB as we, can, as we could. Um, and actually, um, by the end of the study, we found almost a third of patients had microbiologically proven TB. When looking how sputum and urine compared, um, using sputum expert, we could diagnose um, just over a quarter of patients with TB. The urine test did better. Um, urine lamb um, diagnosed almost 40%. Urine expert testing did particularly well in this study, diagnosed almost 60%. And actually, if you combine them both, we could pick up 70% of TB patients with these sort of rapid urine tests. Um, however, when we combine these two urine tests with sputum expert, we could actually diagnose 80% of patients. So this sort of um, provided a, a threefold increase from sputum testing, which is really the standard of care um, and provided promise that actually we could potentially improve TB diagnosis and, and impact patient care using urine diagnostics. However, um, just coming back to the expert um, platform, this PCR platform, despite WHO endorsement back in 2010 um, and quite rapid scale up in um, high high sort of TB and HIV burden settings in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, um, several studies had failed to demonstrate any impact of expert on, on patient outcomes. And the reasons for, the, for those are, are complex. Um, some of it might have been study design and maybe not choosing the right population to do the trials in. And some of it's because um, doctors or clinicians often prescribe TB treatment in the absence of positive test, which negates some of the benefit of better diagnostics. Um, so we really wanted to try and do some studies to understand whether urine testing could improve patient outcomes before sort of um, there was enough evidence to, to implement this um, way of testing. So we wanted to focus on HIV positive inpatients because we knew that's the group that the test um, performed best in, but also that was a group with, a, with the sort of most potential benefit. Um, we wanted to see if we could increase TB diagnoses and TB treatment, bearing in mind that sometimes clinicians treat without a positive test. And we really wanted to see if, if this sort of testing approach could reduce mortality. Um, again, to justify a, a clinical trial or a clinical study, we needed to, to know that um, the downsides of implementing this diagnostic approach was, and even though the, the, the LAM lateral flow assay itself is only three to five dollars, it is expensive in the context of a, um, of a low, research, uh, low um, income country. And there are also potential harms from, from testing. So we therefore did the, the STAMP trial, um, which reported in, in, in 2018. A STAMP trial was a pragmatic multi-country randomized control trial um, in South Africa and Malawi. We recruited, again, um, unselected HIV positive patients who were admitted to hospital. Um, we excluded those who were less than 18 and those who were already on TB treatment. And we then randomized eligible patients to standard of care where we just tested sputum um, with, the, with the expert test. And in the intervention arm, we tested sputum and we also um, did the urine tests. Um, we, we did the testing as part of the study. So the study team did that and we gave the results to the, the clinicians that were looking after the patients. We tried to mask them to, to study arm to reduce any bias. So we reported the, the test results as either sort of TB screening test positive, negative or not done. 
and then we let the, the, the doctors make decisions about whether TB treatment should be started or not. Um, we just measured the outcome. So our primary outcome was whether patients had died by um, 56 days. And then we also assessed whether they'd been diagnosed with, with TB and what the basis of that diagnosis was and whether TB treatment was started. In terms of the results, um, so overall, we did see um, a reduced mortality in the, in the intervention group, although we weren't quite powered to show um, a smaller reduction in mortality as we saw. Um, however, when we looked at particular sort of pre-specified subgroups, so patients with advanced HIV, those with low CD4 counts, um, we did find a, um, a much larger reduction in mortality. And we also found that um, across the board, um, the urine um, diagnostics increased the amount of TB that was diagnosed and, and the amount of TB um, treatment given. We also did a cost effectiveness analysis. Um, as, as Omar was saying, it's important to have those cost effectiveness data for um, policymakers and for implementation. Um, and we found that urine TB testing was cost effective in, in, in inpatients. And we looked at cost effectiveness of different approaches. We found that, that screening using the urine NAM test plus sputum expert was the most cost effective approach. Um, so the, the upshot of, of all of these studies and, um, and data was that we, we showed that urine based TB screening reduced mortality in sicker inpatients and it increased TB diagnosis and treatment um, in, a, in a broader group of patients. And that urine NAM combined with sputum expert testing was the most cost effective approach. So these data contributed to the WHO guideline update in 2019, um, which then recommended urine LAM for TB testing in hospitalized patients. Um, frustratingly, um, urine LAM still hasn't been um, well implemented or as well implemented as we'd like in high HIV TB burden countries. Again, there's lots of complex reasons. Um, and again, it just demonstrates how important having an implementation science perspective is and, and providing the right evidence base not only to sort of global guideline developers but um, local policy makers as well because that was off one of the hurdles that, that sort of stopped land being implemented as well as possible. So um, one of the challenges with the ALEAR LAM test that I talked about was it wasn't very sensitive but there are new more sensitive urine LAM tests in the pipeline um, and this Fuji LAM assay that, that's shown here it, is significantly more sensitive than the, the ALEAR LAM test we used in this in the stamp trial um, and these these accuracy data were done on um, sort of frozen samples um, a year or two ago um, the challenge is we need faster and more efficient translation of these better TB diagnostics to really have an, an impact on TB diagnostics and, and improve patient outcome so just coming towards the end of the, the talk, I'm going to talk about the R2-D2 TB network and how we're advancing TB diagnostics. So TB diagnostic, or diagnostic development more broadly, although it's often faster and cheaper than vaccine development or drug development, you know, it can still take several years and cost a significant amount of money to, to get a, um, a diagnostic test translated and implemented. And in the case of the TB LAM test, um, that was first commercially available in 2013, but it wasn't recommended in guidelines till 2019. So, you know, in, in fitting six years that took. And it is really important we try and shorten this time and reduce the development cost um, for, for future tests, especially given that we could potentially reduce morbidity and mortality for patients with TB. Um, I've borrowed this slide um, from, from Fine, but I think it really nicely outline some of the obstacles confronted by um, diagnostic developers um, and also um, some of the, the evidence that, that we need to overcome them um, and how we can support developers. So a lot of tests fail at the kind of um, early stages, but there are still tests that make it past this that struggle because of um, there's not enough evidence for policy um, and at the clinical trial and regulatory phase. But there are challenges beyond that. Um, and again, getting the right evidence on about impact and um, implementation and improving supply chain. Um, and LAM is an example of a, a test that struggled at, at this, this stage. So we really need to try and address um, all of these um, areas to improve translation. So the R2D2 TB network, which stands for the um, Rapid Research um, in Diagnostic Development, 
Um, it's an innovative, flexible field trials to try and advance novel TB diagnostics. So as part of the network, we, we have scouting and technology selection. So we have a dedicated technology scout that works with um, diagnostic developers and, and commercial organizations to identify early prototypes, late prototypes, and design not products. Um, we focus on use cases based on the World Health Organization priorities, and WHO have produced a series of, of TPPs, which we sort of implement as our, our standards. Um, and within the ongoing sort of clinical cohorts, we're able to, to do small iterative performance assessments for early prototypes um, that allow manufacturers to, to go back and make changes and then do further um, iterative performance tests. We can do larger performance assessments for late um, prototypes, sort of 500 or 750 patients, for example. And then we've also got the capability of doing large scale multi-center evaluations for design lock products. Um, all of this is no cost to the developer. The clinical studies are, are funded by um, the American uh, NIH. In terms of the components of the evaluation, we use standardized protocols for, for the different use cases. Um, we make sure that the, popula the populations that we do clinical studies in are representative of the, the global TB epidemic. Again, one of the challenges with implementing urine LAM was that, um, for example, policymakers in, in Asia said there weren't enough studies on, on local populations for them to, to implement it. So it's important that they are representative geographically and that you include key subpopulations. Um, the studies use a comprehensive reference standard, which, which means that the, the data is sort of good enough for, for regulators. Um, and sort of speaking to what Omar said earlier, we, we've integrated standard human factors as, um, and usability assessments as part of the protocol. And we've got human factors and implementation science specialists as part of the, um, the network. Um, additionally, we do impact modeling and economic evaluations. So really, um, by the end, we, we've got a, a comprehensive package of evidence that can be submitted to um, regulators and policymakers and, and help um, translate diagnostics into practice. So this table just shows the, the three main use cases that we focus on in R2D2. So triage tests, diagnostic tests, and, and drug susceptibility tests for, for drug resistant TB. And these are some of the diagnostic technologies we're evaluating at the moment. Here's a website if you're interested in looking further. Um, so just to summarize briefly, there's a high burden of morbidity and mortality from TB. It's a challenging disease for diagnostics, but we have seen some progress for, in recent years. Um, I think it is important that diagnostic developers focus on, on um, important use cases. Um, and like TB, but also in other infectious diseases, there's the potential to, to demonstrate impact on outcomes. And I think that's really important for policy and implementation. Um, we need more efficient pipelines and pathways to evaluate infection diagnostics. Um, and we need to be able to rapidly and efficiently generate evidence for developers, funders, policymakers, and implementers. Thank you very much for listening. Hopefully I haven't got too much over time and I'm happy to, um, to take any questions. Thank you, Anka. Immaculate, immaculate. If you want to stop sharing, that's great. Uh, we have got a couple of minutes, so please, um, if people would like to ask, is that question in the chat? Um, uh, Gareth, do you want to pop the camera on and ask that? And then um, Peter? Yeah. Hi, oh, that was a great talk, Anka. Thank you very much. I was just interested in how the um, intellectual property rights um, are affected by the NIH taking over funding of the development of the products and whether they then have some commercial interest in the profits. Um, thanks, Gareth. Um, so NIH are purely funding the clinical studies. So there's sort of an ongoing clinical cohort across the, um, th those six, six sites globally. And the kind of um, recruiting of patients, doing um, performing the reference standard and, and all of the kind of analysis around that is being funded by NIH. They're, they're not um, sort of, they don't take any any interest in the in the IPR or any share in the, in, in the profit. So um, they're sort of purely funding the, the, the clinical evidence generation um, and the IPR remains with, with the companies. Um, I mean, sometimes that, it, it can be tricky and we try and sort of have you know very open arrangements with with developers about sharing data and um etc but so far um i think because of the benefit for developers everyone's sort of really open to this model and it seems to work well 
maybe I could have a supplemental. I mean, I think it's always dangerous to ask questions where you don't know the answer. But in terms of your, how did how did Alia find the data? Was it was it helpful to them, or were they indifferent, or or what what was their response to? Because I, I assume yeah. you did it them designing or analysing it. So we didn't actually. So for Stamp was was fairly independent of Alia. Um, in fact, they didn't even you know we even bought the the, the kits off them. Um, you know, they really didn't have any involvement in, in the study at all. Um, and I mean, I think they'd, they'd been involved in, in, I think, other, other um, diagnostic accuracy studies, um, but we purposefully tried to be as independent as possible. Um, I mean, generally, I think the, when I sort of presented the results to them um, later, I think they were sort of pleased with the, with the results, but it was a slightly tricky time because I think Alia were being taken over by Abbott at, at that point. Um, and again, uh, that's probably contributed to, to some of the challenges about scaling up and implementation and um, sort of device availability. But, but I think it is important that clinical studies are, are done independently for, for obvious reasons. Yeah, I was just wondering about the balance between the sort of Fujilam data and the Alirlam data, which you alluded to. And I think you were suggesting that the performance of the Fujilam test in, in vitro or, or you know, might, might be better, but whether how you balance off high quality clinical data versus lab data and deciding which one's best sure no absolutely and i think that's been a um a big challenge actually the um there have been a few um large multi uh, multi-country value perspective evaluations of fujilam where the, the data are sort of just just coming out now um again if you think fuji those early kind of studies that would were started in 2018 for fujilam and I think having networks like R2D2 who have been evaluating Fujilam, we, we've managed to get to the stage where there's been prospective clinical studies coming out already, at, um, you know, three or four years later, which has been much quicker than, than for Alia. So I think it goes to show um, that you can speed the process up. But I think they're um, much like the R2D2 network. I think one of the keys are for these important um, diseases, if you can have cohorts that are kind of ongoing, that you can sort of just quickly slip in um, promising diagnostic to evaluate, you can really cut down the time. But it is, um, I guess that's one of the risks developers take by getting involved in these platforms are there might be, you know, other other devices that that look better um, and that might implement that, whether their, their device is, um, is sort of translated and implemented or not. Yeah, okay. Um, there's a question from Peter in the chat. Um, He's asking whether you can tell us how cost effectiveness was calculated in the South Africa trial. I'm guessing he doesn't want a detailed methodology, but um, perhaps if you can give a sort of answer. And Peter, if you have a specific aspect that you're interested in, please say. Uh, not specific. I'm just curious to know because there's so many potential variables that you might have put into this. And I just, when you say one is more cost effective than the other, I, I think we need to be very clear about what it is that you have used by way of variables. Sure. Yeah, it was done with um, the cost effectiveness modeling was done with a, um, a group that do a lot of um, HIV related cost effectiveness modeling. And they've got a model that kind of looks at um, that kind of looks at um, HIV survival um, and TB is obviously an important cause of, um, of morbidity and mortality. So we, we basically modeled um, a lot of the, the, the lives saved and the cost of the, um, the lives saved. Um, by implementing the test in, in those patients um, to come up with the cost effectiveness um, estimates. So it's really around um, live save. One of the challenges with doing cost effectiveness analyses in a low resource setting is the bar is, is really low for if things are cost effective because you've got such um, low health expenditure and such low GDP. Um, so it can be challenging to kind of make those conclusions as to whether things are worth implementing based on cost effectiveness analysis. Okay, because one of the things which we've been looking at is the organizational cost, for example, of implementing a different diagnostic test, whatever it might be, whether it be training costs, resource costs, all sorts of things, actually. Organizational costs, whereby actually you've got people doing that versus something else that they would have been doing, so opportunity costs. So um, I'm not sure how relevant it is in this context, but it's certainly relevant in a lot of the contexts that we look at these yeah. things. So we certainly looked at, um, you know, that we looked at the costs of the test, but we also looked at the cost of the time of healthcare workers performing the test. Um, so, and we, so we did quite a, a detailed kind of from a, a health 
system and the hospital perspective um, costing of, of them. So you try and take in as much into account as you can. Thanks, Anka. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Anka. I think hopefully uh, if you can stick around, we'll, we'll have some Q&A at the end. And I think there probably might be some things that we want to pick up on, on there. Um, and please do keep putting questions in the chat. Um, Shan Shan, are you happy to load up your slides? Um, and I think you're going to tell us about a case example of, of working with a particular diagnostic. So I'll just hand over to you. Yeah. Uh, can everybody see my slides well? Yeah, you're just on, um, I don't know what view that is, but you just need to click the presenter slideshow button. Okay. Uh, you're now, uh, yeah, you're on presenter view now. So if you just do slideshow. That's one way to do it. If you get, yeah, if you go to the left, that one, yeah. If you go this, to the, that, that one right, that's it. That's a slideshow. Yep. Oh. Okay, yeah. maybe go back to the previous one and do it in a larger format if you need to. Well, that's... If anybody else has got. Uh, Shan, yeah, if you launch your slideshow as you did before. Yep. Yeah, and then if you go into the top left hand corner, you'll see swap displays. Ah. Click on swap displays. Just okay. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Oh, thank you so much. Thank no you. Worries. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Shen from London IVD. So as Omar mentioned, we are a unit made of multidisciplinary experts to work on assessment and adoption of new technologies. It's a great pleasure being here to share one of our projects related to the CMV infections in neonates. So the focus of this presentation will be to demonstrate how we work on assessing new technologies and pave its way to the adoption, engaging with multiple stakeholders, such as clinicians and patients. So uh, what is CMV? It is a type of herbs virus, which every one of us might experience in our life. It might not be a big thing, it's not dangerous at all for healthy adults, but may lead to very severe consequences in people with very low immune systems, such as newborn babies or HIV patients as well. Uh, every year, there are around 5,000 babies who are affected by the CMV virus, and it's the most common case of congenital malformation, which may lead to the disability such as hearing loss. This will generate a cost for the healthcare system for caring for these babies and lead to a significant societal cost as a result of those disabilities. So in the absence of vaccination, the key would be early detection, early diagnosis and early treatment. Antivirals could reduce the disease severity while behavioral or surgical interventions may also have a major impact on the symptoms. But the problem is it, more than 50% of neonates who are affected will not show symptoms which may de well delay the diagnosis. Thus the chance for treatment might be missed, long-term clinical outcomes could be worse, and the cost of healthcare system is thus higher. So at the moment, um, how do we diagnose CMV virus. So it's ordered by the clinician who is su suspicious that the baby may have CMV infection and they may order PCR test, which is a very expensive and time consuming lab based method. This new technology here will use a nanobiosensor, sensor, which will provide a direct quantitative detection of CMV virus in the sample. This is very low cost and easy to use. It is suitable for a universal newborn screening. So um, as I mentioned previously, this project, uh, with this project, we have a multidisciplinary team and we're using a mixed methodology. Here, I would like just to show you one of the aspects, which is how we engage with our key stakeholders, such as patients and clinicians. So with patients, we have established a steering group and we meet regularly for the project teams to provide updates to the patient representatives and also for patient representatives to give feedback to the project team. We also keep constant email exchange in between meetings. In addition, this year, we brought the project to the Imperial Exhibition Road event in June, where the researchers at Imperial showcased their research to the general public. 
We organized the round tables and we provided drinks to the public visitors. And we managed to have more than 20 visitors, including five parents with their babies. So at the event, we asked three questions to our uh, visitors. The, question, the first question was about acceptance. All, all, all the parents agreed to the screening and some even mentioned they are happy to pay for it privately if it is not provided by the NHS and if it is necessary, let's say, if it is proved needed. And the sec second question was about the location. All the voters think this can be combined with the neonate checkup within the 21 days. So usually the, the woman and the baby will be discharged within 72 hours, and then there will be the community midwives who per perform the checkups to the babies. So there are different places where the test could take place. And then the last question was about, are you able to take the samples by yourselves? Uh, as researchers, we are thinking also because of the COVID, this is so easy to take a sample as we are doing almost every day with the COVID exam. So are, however, opposite to what we believed, almost all the, none of the visitors mentioned that they were able to take the take the samples by themselves. Parents said, oh, they might be very overwhelmed immediately after the birth of the baby, and they are not sure they can do it correctly. So they would like to have a healthcare professional to take the samples by themselves. And as we identified in our stakeholder analysis work, midwives are considered very, very important and influential in the adoption. It was also mentioned during the exhibition road event by a visitor whose wife is midwife. So he said to us, okay, uh, have you asked the midwife if, if they are willing to perform this test, considering their, uh, their work is very demanding and they are carrying a very huge backpack going around house by house. So we, we, we are very lucky to, to have a workshop with the midwives. We, ha we had a workshop with 15 midwives and we presented this project to them and we collected very, very insight, insightful suggestions from, from the midwife. The first one is they, they think a quick test, a quick saliva test especially, would be considered very acceptable. And all of them think the hospital would be the ideal place to perform the test instead of the community settings. Uh, to make sure all the tests is performed correctly. Also the community care varies from community to, to community. And they also uh, actually ask three very valuable questions. The first one is why don't we test a pregnant woman? And if we test pregnant woman, how accurate, accurate would it be compared to the standard PCR blood test? And the second question would be following the first, uh, why, why don't we test the pregnant woman? They asked how frequent would this test be if, if testing the pregnant woman, if it would be the first trimester or the last trimester or the second one. And can, test, and can we test women who potentially might have symptoms or when they see the fetus are not developing well? And how to deliver the message to the women and their family is very, very um, sensitive here. One of the midwives mentioned that one of his patients who, who discovered to have a CMV infection, fatal infections, they decided to terminate the pregnancy. So this is also a very sensitive point. And the second question was about the frequency of testing the newborn babies. And the last one was, if the newborn is test positive, then what's the pathway? How can he or she be treated? Where can we put the newborns in the postnatal wards, which is usually very busy, or put in the uh, neonatal wards? So these are all very valuable questions that we, we collected from the midwives, and we, we will update the project team with. And uh, as part of the project, we have also our health economists to, to create a health economic model to simulate a cohort of newborns in the UK to compare the impact of different testing methods to eventually create a national business case to facilitate, facilitate the adoption. So this project is still ongoing and we are still recruiting the parents with babies who have 
uh, CMV infections. So this, if you are interested, please feel free to contact me. So this is uh, my presentation and feel free to ask me any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Shen Shen. Um, any questions in the chat or going forward? I mean, I think I could imagine quite a lot of questions about the pathway of, of diagnosis here. Um, you talked about the maternal diagnosis. So, I mean, clearly trying to intervene early before transmission to a child is preferable and it's not uncommon for either acute infection or, or recurrent infection in pregnancy. So is there any work going on with this particular approach in that group? It would seem quite a, quite a useful thing to do. Uh, so we collected a lot of feedback relating to testing pregnant women from the CMV charity, from the patients, and also from the midwives. So we are going to bring this question to the project team next, next week to, to get an answer. Okay, um, Bernarda, do you want to just introduce yourself and um, if you have a question? Uh, yeah, well, I have a response. Uh, the problem with testing women, I have read in the literature in a cost effectiveness analysis done for screening in China, is that the treatment to pregnant women is not uh, strongly recommended. Then uh, antivirals, antivirals for children work well, but treating pregnant women is not very, is, there is, the evidence is not as strong. Yeah, that, that is true. And particularly if you want to be treating in first trimester, then, then that, that's a challenge. I think I saw a question in the chat. Rob, do you want to just put your camera on and ask? Yeah, I mean, though, if, if the antivirals aren't tolerated by the pregnant women, this may be a bit moot, but I was just wondering what the timing is where transplacental kind of CMV infection is going to cause the most damage to the fetus. So when, when, if you could, you know, treat pregnant women, when, when would the timing be that you're going to have the most impact? Yeah, this is, yeah, this is also one of the questions we collected to understand the impact during three uh, trimester during the pregnancy. Um, so we, we will really ask the a project team for this question next week. So we do have some expert pediatricians yeah. on, on the call if they want to chip in. But I mean, yes. Uh, yes, and for testing the babies, newborn babies is considered uh, is suggested within twenty one days for the newborn screening. But it, so. but it would be early first trimester, which is the real concern. I think Bob is your question. Uh, Michael, is that which Michael is that? Um, do you want to just ask a question, Michael? Sure, I'm on the train though. Um, yeah, so surely you would want, so what's the, what, first of all, what is the cost comparison between the PTR and saliva test, which I assume is some sort of immunoassay? And then if you found out that the test should be done in a hospital, wouldn't it make more sense to try and innovate on the PCR side, so pooling of patient samples, since you assume the prevalence would be quite low actually in this population? Yeah, that's really a very good question. So in terms of the cost comparison, a PCR test at the moment uh, at, at the London hospital would be around 150 pound because there's also cost sending the sample to the lab. And with this new technology, um, the cost still needs to be defined, depends on the quantity of production, but it will be lower than five pound per unit. So this is a very big distinction. Yeah, you didn't mention heel prick testing. I mean, I don't all kids have a card that you can test with a sample that's taken at, at birth. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, but this is, uh, it, it was, this test was initially invented for urine test, but then um, uh, the clinicians think it is very difficult to take urine sample. They have to squeeze the net piece. And now they are developing into the saliva test. So it's similar to heel prick, but it's not a blood test, it's a saliva test. And, he, and you didn't say much about the test or where it's come from. So can you say any more about that? I, I'd be curious. Uh, oh, well, this um, we are under the NDA for the technology, but it will be a very small and portable device. And it will not only tell you yes or no, it will also tell you it's a quantitative detection. It will tell you the percentage. So. Um, Later on, we can uh, study if there's a correlation between the percentage and the treatment. 
Okay. Um, any other questions for the moment? You were doing a fine job of getting ahead of time, which is very good. Um, if not, then perhaps if you could just stop sharing your slides there, that would be great. And I'm not sure, actually, do we know if Adam, our next speaker, is here yet? Um, perhaps uh, he hasn't joined us yet. Um, he should be uh, due to join us soon. Okay, if you just drop it, I think he has got some clinical duties, I think, hasn't he? So um, Yes, yeah, that's right. Perhaps if you can nudge him on email or in some other way, that would be quite helpful. Um, okay, I will ask him. We, we can see where we've got to. I can see Gareth still on. Gareth, can I poke you to see whether you have any thoughts about how we improve pathways for CMV diagnosis? I guess you're better qualified in this. Yeah, I, I, in fact, I just was sending an email to Shan Shan because um, obviously Prof Hermione Lyle is, is intimately uh, involved and is the leading clinical researcher based at Imperial, but also has an international reputation now for her work around really pressing for improved diagnostics. And um, is she already in your working group? Uh, no. Right. No. Yeah, in this project, we are working with the clinician from the UCL, UCLH. So yeah, not. Ah, okay. Yeah. Well, Shan Chan, if 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 please, if you wouldn't mind responding to my email, I'll put you in touch with Hermione because um, this is hugely uh, relevant and of interest to her, and uh, and and I think you'll find her very receptive to really pushing this forwards. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> And, and right. Shanshan, I, should, I should declare my interest. So I have a daughter who's got uh, bilateral cochlear implantation as a consequence of CMV. So if you need if you need parents who know a little bit about one end of it, then let me know. Oh, uh, oh, we should, we should thank you so much. Thank you. Um, all right. So it sounds like our next speaker is with us now. Um, is that right, Nalko? Is Adam here? Hi, Adam. Sorry. Thanks for joining. I know that you've got clinical. Ah, clinical Adam, YouTube. yes. Thank so you very much, Adam, when you are so busy in uh, amongst your clinical duties. Oh, well, it's a pleasure to join you. I thought I was just on time. I hope I'm not late. No, you are. We, we, were, we were rattling through in an unprecedented fashion. So, so thank you. Um, I'll let you, have you got your slides ready or do you need me to yeah, fill yeah. a stuff for you? With a bit of luck, let's just see. You know, there's always this moment of, of truth, isn't there? Can you see them so, now? Yeah, that's great. So I think at, at, at the start, I was saying that, you know, I think in, in response to COVID, we saw as I said before, this kind of early slow response followed by a lot of innovation. There was innovation in tests, which we'll hear a bit about later. And then there was innovation in systems and, and groups who came together to try and try and do things better, in a more coordinated way, faster, and, um, and try and bring the evidence to effect quite quickly. And one of these groups was the Condor Network, which I think Adam's going to talk to us about now. So I'll just hand over to you, Adam. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think Naoko asked me to speak about one particular part of the Condor work, which was the Condor work package that, that I led around care homes. Condor was a multidisciplinary, multi-centre collaboration looking at COVID point of care diagnostics. And there were um, three main uh, work streams, one around um, acute care, which was called the, the Raptor study, uh, one around uh, primary care, uh, um, uh, and uh, one around um, uh, care homes. And that was a Condor CH study. And the Condor CH study was the one that I was asked to lead. Uh, this was one of these things that came together very rapidly in the pandemic. I can still remember standing in one of those long queues around a supermarket car park and receiving a call from a colleague saying, I know you've never done any point of care diagnostics work before, but you do care homes. And could you come and join the group and advise us on how to do some point of care diagnostic work in care homes? So this is just to summarise a little bit of the progress we made through that, uh, some of the challenges we faced, uh, and some of the sort of uh, kind of insights we've developed and uh, uh, thoughts we have about how to progress uh, going forward. Yeah, I've titled the talk to the rescue uh, because um, there was initially a sense in some of the uh, the, the media coverage of, of this project when we started up, up that, you know, uh, the Condor technologies were going to come to the rescue of the care home sector. There was one article in particular in the Telegraph that said um, this new research study is going to allow everyone to hug their granny by next week. Uh, and uh, it didn't quite pan out that way. Uh, but there is a sense still that these tests may add value to the long term care sector. And uh, we can maybe reflect on that a bit more when we get to the discussion. 
Uh, so uh, most of you will now be relatively familiar with care homes uh, because because they um, hit the newspapers and uh, the um, television media quite a lot during the pandemic. Uh, prior to the pandemic, it was a relatively safe bet uh, that most meetings that I spoke at, people had no real sense of what a care home was unless they had had a relative uh, living in one. Uh, but just to give you a little bit of context, there are about 450,000 people uh, living in UK care homes, the bulk of those in care homes in England, uh, you know, and a small number obviously in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. Um, although there are specialist care homes for people uh, with learning difficulties and there are some super specialised care homes for people with um, complex mental health problems or alcohol and drug dependency, the bulk of the care home sector is uh, what we call care homes for older people and the average age in a UK care home is 82 years of age. And the people who live there are medically complex, they have multiple diagnoses, the average number of uh, diagnoses is eight diagnoses per resident, uh, usually more than one long-term condition, and uh, they're in a care home for a reason, uh, which is that they live with either disability or frailty, and about 70 to 80 percent of care home residents have uh, dementia. Many are approaching the end of their lives, uh, and uh, big sort of national cohort studies have suggested that on average, uh, the average life expectancy in a nursing home, uh, now called a care home with nursing, uh, is one year, and in a residential home, now called a care home without nursing, is uh, two years. Now that belies a really quite uh, substantial variation where some people arrive and just last a very short number of weeks because they're there for end of life care, and other people may live there for four or five years or longer but on average most people are in the last couple of years of their lives when they move to the care home sector. Care homes were devastated by COVID for a number of different reasons uh, which we uh, may or may not have time to discuss here today that's a whole seminar in and of itself but during the first wave of the pandemic in UK care homes 48% of all people that died in the UK from COVID uh, were care home residents so really quite devastated uh, care homes during the pandemic. Now, part of the problem there was uh, lack of safeguards from a number of different perspectives, including uh, limited access to personal protective equipment, um, uh, limited say over who was entering the care home and where from, um, and it also really, during those very early days in the pandemic, um, in, uh, in an inability to access COVID testing. By the time that the Condor study came along in August of uh, 2020, so we moved quite quickly to get the funding for this uh, collaborative venture, um, uh, things had changed a little bit and uh, care homes had uh, really quite structured uh, uh, protocols in place that really didn't just open up uh, PCR polymerase chain reaction testing to them, but uh, it really uh, very specifically mandated how and when they were supposed to access it for both staff and residents and what they were supposed to do if they got a positive uh, result. Um, so what we did right at the beginning of the Condor study was sort of to get a sense of uh, what the status quo was. And if you had uh, spoken to uh, uh, Department of Health representatives at this time, they'd have said, well, it's very straightforward. You know, we've got laboratory capacity. We've got these testing kits. All the care home staff have to do is to go onto a website, order the testing kits, uh, get them delivered to the care home, do the tests and send them off. But actually, Massimo Makochi, who is one of the researchers working with us, and I think he's on the call at the moment, uh, really went through all the processes involved in uh, preparing to do a test, doing a test, sending the test results off and, manage, and managing the results of the test and demonstrated that really this was quite a complex and difficult uh, scenario for care homes to manage with particular bottlenecks being difficulties with the tests arriving at the wrong time or in, in insufficient numbers or uh, going missing or taking a long time after they had been sent off. And so it was clear from lots of of different uh, angles uh, that this was not suiting the care homes particularly well, particularly when you consider that care homes may have up to 100 residents and a 100 resident care home uh, may have up to four or 500 staff and they were having to do this for staff at this point uh, multiple times a week and residents uh, once a week. So really quite time consuming and demanding with these tests being ordered by post and then delivered. 
Uh, the other thing that sort of made us start to realize that uh, the kind of send off uh, testing wasn't working so well for care homes was it was um, a lot of delays that faced care home um, it, residents and staff in terms of getting the test results back. And we were having issues around about November, December time of last year, uh, where uh, care home uh, staff, for example, uh, would have uh, some mild symptoms of an upper respiratory tract infection, take a PCR test for COVID and then be forced to wait off work uh, for a fortnight, which is longer than the duration of the illness, uh, until uh, their test result came back saying that they didn't have COVID in the first place, or they did have COVID in the first place. And so clearly these tests, by, the, by, by uh, autumn's December, uh, autumn fruit of December of 2020, uh, were not doing the job uh, that they were intended to do. And that's where the idea of point of care testing uh, came in. And so we uh, um, set out in the Condor CH uh, work stream uh, to look at whether point of care diagnostic technologies for COVID-19 can be used in care homes. Uh, it's a very different sort of setting from the other settings that they're being evaluated. So we wanted to consider whether that would compromise their accuracy. Um, we chose to do this using rapid evaluation of, of already CE mark technologies. And the reason was that I had a long experience of doing research in the care home sector, research infrastructure around care homes is not well developed and we knew that we had to uh, really um, uh, sort of do this almost as a, an evaluation of a new technology, a clinical evaluation, uh, to make sure that we didn't fall foul of really quite uh, difficult uh, research governance in the care home sector. Uh, and therefore we conducted the whole piece largely as a service evaluation within service evaluation governance uh, frameworks. That proved to be very sensible and, and prescient. Another study that I was involved in, the Protect CH study, which I led, um, uh, looking at um, COVID prophylaxis in care homes, uh, it really uh, got tripped up uh, by uh, um, lack of research governance and lack of research infrastructure around care homes to the point that we were never really able to randomise a resident uh, to that study in anger. So doing it this way during the pandemic turned out to be very sensible indeed. Uh, so we evaluated a few different technologies. Uh, the first uh, technology we evaluated and, and, and the first paper uh, we presented uh, was a, a point of care uh, a PCR machine. Um, uh, you see this, uh, this um, news article from the BBC at the time and they've blurred out the manufacturer's name, but we've since published this. And if you click on the QR code, you could immediately find out who the manufacturer was. Uh, this was a technology by Hariba. Uh, the technology was called uh, Pocket. Um, it was a, a machine it had initially been developed for PCR uh, work in, in a veterinary context, but had been repurposed for use uh, for COVID-19. Uh, this machine is quite interesting. It runs seven samples at once, but it requires staff to do quite technical things, including uh, using a, a Gilson pipette. Uh, now, for some context here, um, some care homes have uh, nurses, and no although your average nurse has never used a Gilson pipette, uh, but some care homes are staffed entirely by, uh, so you know, care homes without nursing, are staffed entirely by uh, staff who have uh, no uh, nursing qualification and often no uh, higher educational qualification. So if they ever have used a Gilson pipette, the last time they will have done so would have been in uh, GCSE uh, or um, A-level uh, chemistry. Uh, so we, we thought this might be quite technical for care home staff. I was initially nervous about rolling this technology out, uh, but the care home staff themselves that we were working with, who helped us to kind of co-design the protocols and evaluation framework, said, that they thought they could learn it uh, and learn it they did um, and we found that this machine actually was, was was relatively easy and relatively safe to implement we didn't identify any major issues around uh, safety with this machine um, and and we showed that it had pretty good uh, diagnostic agreement and, and, and diagnostic accuracy you can click on the qr code there for the for the precise statistics um, but uh, um, there were a few technical issues particularly around uh, batching of tests so you know running one each each run of a test in this machine takes between 30 and 40 minutes um, and um, uh, it runs uh, seven tests at a time so if you run it with one test and it, it's not a very efficient use of time if you run it with seven tests and it, it's a relatively efficient use of time uh, but you have to structure your day so that you have seven samples but no more than seven samples all collected at once and, and ready to run so we learned a lot about uh, about um, running these types of technologies in the care home sector we were the first people ever I think in the world as best I, as I can work out to use point of care PCR and care homes. Uh, we showed it could be done, uh, but there were some organizational limitations around it. The next technology uh, we chose to use was one called um, uh, Lumira DX. Again, you know, at the time that we were doing this, we kept it quite uh, um, 
close to our chest who we were working with, but the, the, the work has since published and the manufacturers are named on that. And again, you can get the paper through the QR code. Lumira DX is a different type of technology. It's an automated antigen test. Uh, it's a much smaller piece of kit. Uh, you can actually see it in the, the first picture on the top left hand corner. Then you can see it's uh, um, just about the size of the person's hand uh, sitting on the desk just below their hand. And the pictures on this slide are quite interesting, which is when the human factors team, Massimo, uh, Pete Buckle and colleagues at, uh, uh, um, at the Imperial Unit uh, started to look at this technology. They wondered whether there was a possibility uh, for uh, contamination of uh, users in the surroundings, uh, because what the machine had was a card that you uh, dropped a, a, a sample of buffer with uh, uh, your specimen in it onto, and then the machine uh, uh, did some sort of vibrating stuff in order to um, um, take the sample into the uh, analysis bed. And um, there was a real worry that either when you were putting the sample on or when you were uh, working with the machine that you could get some contamination of surfaces or surroundings. And so Massimo came up with a really great idea of using uh, um, uh, this kind of glow dye that shows up under dark light uh, to uh, run a dry tests. So this was done using samples that didn't have any uh, human uh, materials in them. And we basically got the um, care home staff to work through the whole process from uh, being at the bedside, taking the sample to running it on the machine to see where uh, the opportunities for contamination arose. And you can see there were several opportunities for contamination from this machine, from uh, gloves, bench top, uh, and the bin lid. And the manufacturer, to their great credit, said, well, they hadn't uh, really thought about this in a care home context before, and they wanted to work with us to get the SO SOPs right so that this wouldn't happen. And so Massimo worked to change the SOPs for the care home staff. And we did a subsequent set of dry runs, having modified the approach to taking the sample and to running the machine. And we found that there was no contamination the second time around. Again, the diagnostic accuracy of this technology was very good, but it was the insights around the application of it and how we had to modify its use for application in the care home sector uh, that really made a difference. Um, whilst we were doing all of this, of course, uh, lateral flow tests came along and they very much became the mainstay of uh, testing uh, in the care home sector and more widely. Um, uh, uh, although there were tests of um, the diagnostic accuracy of lateral flow tests, I think it's worth recognising that they didn't go undergo the same sort of in-depth, in-context evaluation uh, that we've conducted for these PCR and antigen tests in part of Condor. But we did, working with colleagues at Liverpool, uh, do some very limited uh, usability work uh, with the, the, the lateral flow tests in care homes. Uh, and this is a paper from Age and Aging, which is published and led by John Tullough, but the Condor team are all uh, co-authors on it. And this was looking at 1,770 lateral flow tests. Um, uh, and the interesting thing was when you looked at what staff were supposed to be doing with the lateral flow tests, only 8.6% of staff achieved 75% or more of the protocol uh, adherence, and only 25% of staff achieved 50% or more of the protocol adherence, which was arguably um, uh, even uh, less good than we saw when we were working with those other technologies as part of the Condor study. Uh, and uh, Patrick Kierkegaard did a lot of background work gathering qualitative data about what it was that really was going on here and really staff were um, overworked and they had a lot of cognitive burden going on at the side at the time uh, the, the procedures surrounding testing were not always very clearly laid out and there was also a sense at this point because lateral flow tests have been subject to a lot of debate in the media that they didn't fully trust the tests and so that uh, had a lot of impact upon how careful they were when they used them uh, and how uh, they approached the tests on a day-to-day -day basis so um, I guess the lesson from that is if we could have done the same sort of uh, in-depth in context evaluation for these lateral flow tests uh, we might have um, been able to make them even more effective than they've turned out to be uh, and we might also have thought more critically uh, about their application in the care home sector. So we faced a few challenges with Condor because, we, I mean, we only were able to do this work because we adopted that service evaluation type approach. Without that, we would have almost certainly fallen at the first hurdle. Uh, but that meant that we had a no real uh, research SOP in the traditional sort of high fidelity RCT sense of the word uh, and we didn't really have a strong contractual framework with either the care homes or the manufacturers uh, because of good grace good favor and everybody working for the common good we managed to hold it together very well most of the time uh, with these two manufacturers in particular there were other examples where things didn't perhaps go uh, so well and uh, a stronger contractual framework better SOPs would have helped avoid that 
Um, we didn't have enough time or resource to do health economics as part of this piece of work. And the health economics of this stuff is complex. Uh, so lateral flow tests went out in the end because they were cheaper. It's not altogether clear that lateral flow tests are more cost effective when you think consider the economic consequences of false positives and false negatives uh, and what impact that has on care homes opening and shutting down, staff availability, staff absence, etc. And health economics could have been quite powerful in terms of really comparing these different types of technology. Um, and at the, at, um, uh, you know, we, 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 these technologies were not subsequently rolled out. It is clear uh, that we uh, did help inform government decision making about whether to take these technologies on or, or not. Um, although it's uh, lateral flows and um, these automated tests were obviously not being compared on a level uh, playing field. Um, but the route to impact for us throughout this process was really quite uncertain because of the slightly chaotic nature of how a lot of these decisions were made uh, during the pandemic. So just a little bit about where we might be going uh, next or, uh, with this kind of thought process. I mean, we've shown that these technologies can work. Uh, we've shown that uh, they can be safely used in a care home sector. We've shown that human factors type approaches are required required to understand the real uh, health and safety risks associated with implementing them in the real world. Um, you know, but COVID uh, um, uh, lateral flow tests now uh, rule the roost with regards to COVID uh, diagnosis. And so where do these type of automated tests fit in? And it's likely to be something to do with multiplex testing, where you can test for more than one virus. You know, you can imagine lining up uh, three different lateral flows side by side and running three different samples into them could very quickly become quite demanding. But if you can put one test into one test bay in one, in one machine and it can give you three separate results, uh, then that could be really quite powerful when you're working through a winter, which is more typical than the last two winters, uh, which will be not just COVID and circulation, but also the respiratory and kitio virus and influenza. Uh, this initially seems like a no-brainer, doesn't it? The more information you can get, the better, and this would help care homes to make better decisions running through the winter. But actually, uh, interview work that we've been doing with care home staff has suggested that it's a little bit more complicated than, than, than would first meet the eye, because each of these uh, uh, viruses has a different kind of constellation of uh, uh, possible outcomes. So for RSV, you can either isolate the person in situ or you can escalate them to hospital. But for SARS-CoV-2, there are no treatments that you can initiate in, in situ depending upon the results. And for flu, uh, there's also uh, the idea of secondary prevention. So there are guidelines in care homes in England that state that if you've got a flu outbreak, then you need to consider giving Tamiflu to all the contacts of the person with flu. And so what this can effectively mean if you're running a care home with 40 or 50 residents is uh, that you end up having to run multiple complex protocols in parallel in order to make sure that you follow the best evidence-based care and response to uh, your testing uh, result. Um, not to mention, uh, uh, you know, uh, the kind of logistics of gathering the samples and getting them to the machine and everything else that we've discussed before. So the kind of burden associated with this is really quite substantial. And uh, we need to be careful that as we move towards this, that we're not sort of opening Pandora's box. So we've already done some interviews and focus group works with care home staff around this. We're about to do some survey work with care homes. And then we hope to use that as a basis of, uh, uh, you know, uh, bids for funding to look more at these types of technologies in this sector going forward. Uh, so to summarise, um, we found during this, this uh, project that novel technologies, including highly technical devices such as PCR that require gills and pipettes, I would never have believed that before the pandemic, uh, are feasible in care homes. Um, yeah, we've shown that the validation of the test, you know, the sort of really hard, you know, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, et cetera, is probably better done not in the care home sector, but elsewhere. That can be done in a hospital clinic, primary care setting. But context-specific evaluation, human factors, in-context diagnostic accuracy, barriers and facilitators to implementation can only be done by actually trying these in a care home setting. Compare the difference between PCR, uh, uh, automated anti-unit, and lateral flow that I just showed you. And uh, last but not least, uh, multiplex testing will raise further challenges. Um, and so if we're going to uh, think about implementing this in the care home sector, we really should research it uh, before pushing forward uh, with implementation. I'm sure I've said some stuff that has uh, challenged or uh, uh, um, uh, possibly raised some controversy and happy to take questions or discuss further. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adam. Um, that, that was fantastic. And um, I don't know if you are you able to stick around till you yeah, sure. four o'clock. I mean, I think we'll yeah. do a couple of questions now and then maybe we'll come back to some more later because I could imagine. Yeah. 
So I can be with you till three, but I have to go, <laughs> go back to the board. Well, let's, let's see how far we get now, because I think, as you say, there's a lot of food for thought in there. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of a couple in the chat. Anka, do you want to ask your one? Sure, thank, thanks for that, um, Adam. It's a great talk. I was just wondering whether the contamination work had been done on other um, COVID lateral flow devices or molecular tests, because I imagine lots of them will, will have similar issues with contamination. No, 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 we, it hasn't, you know, and it's really quite interesting, you know, we, um, we actually didn't do it with the first technology either, and it was more just, you know, as Massimo sat down and did a process evaluation of how this whole process hung together, we started to, you know, identify particular high risk points for this, uh, this technology where it might be a particular risk, and then we came up with the idea of the glow dye, I think someone had been watching CSI the night before or something, and that was where the idea came from, uh, but um, uh, no, and, you know, it makes you think that we probably should be doing it with a wider range of technologies. Yeah. I think, about, you know, how I've, I've had COVID three times now, and I think about how I do my lateral flows at home. And I'm sure that by the time I finish doing them, everything's covered in COVID. And I haven't really thought about how, you know, how I could potentially be spreading it to other people. Yeah, we use the um, the UV dyes when we were training for looking after Ebola patients as well. It's quite a useful um, bit of kit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you just don't, uh, the care home staff hadn't realised that they touched these surfaces uh, until it was, you know, until they went around with the the, the, the um, uh, black light, and uh, it was only when they sort of replayed it in their head they worked out what it was that they'd done in order to to, to lead to the cross contamination. Mm, yeah, no, lots that lots that needs to be gone back to, I guess. Um, Pete, did you want to come in? Uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Uh, congratulations on completing the marathon on Sunday. First of all, I bet your legs are sore. Uh, but brilliant effort. Um, a couple of things. One, really, just to pick up on Anchor's point, actually, because having done that little piece of research, it was only a tiny little sort of uh, uh, insight. We've had a lot of interest from laboratory uh, scientists as well who are doing these tests about some of the usability issues around evaluating and undertaking a lot of the tests that they do in laboratory settings. So it, it actually runs much, much broader than this. But my main question, I think, is to you, Adam, I think I probably do know the answer, but I like your perspective on it, is you might think that post-COVID, with 48% of deaths in the first wave having been actually basically care home residents once or another, that we would now have uh, a great deal of attention on how we can do better research in that particular setting of uh, care. And I just wonder how you feel we've learned from that, or is it always going to be kind of, you know, a distant relative to what happens in the acute sector? Um, so I think there is a sense um, of um, a determination to make it better, Peter, <coughs> particularly amongst the, um, the NIHR. Uh, you know, I think they feel almost... Um, embarrassed to an extent that there was such a discrepancy between what they were able to do in health uh, and in social care uh, during the pandemic and um, it was quite I, I went to an NHR senior investigators event yesterday and they had a social care speaker along uh, and I and I and I said at the end her, I said uh, are you pleased to be invited along? She said, well, pleased to be invited along, but I was the only social care speaker in the entire programme all day. And so there is a sense that NHR recognise the need to shift, but that they're not quite there yet, I think. In terms of a platform, I don't think there is a platform really to do this. And we're still at this stage that we that we have at the moment where we build up the, the resource that we've done for Condor and then break it down. Um, you know, you know fine well, there's been another study in Leeds around, around a contact tracing called the contact study, and they will lose their cohort at the end. And there's a, another study in Bristol around uh, air filtration which you know about and they'll lose their cohort at the end uh, so I think there needs to be something looking at how we uh, hold on to care homes and research and, and build them as a research platform to do this type of work I'm doing a bit of a bid at the moment around an RCT platform which is the same sort of principle you know that, that, that um, uh, when you uh, get them into an RCT you want to try to retain them so you retain the skills and the SOPs and everything that go with that um, but I think we could do with something equivalent for um, real world testing and the sort of human factors work that you've been doing here and I suspect that the sort of care homes that want to help with this might be a little, a little bit different from the sort of care homes that want to get involved in, in RCTs. You know, some managers will be very uh, driven by wanting to drive the research agenda forwards. Others will just really want to do practical stuff with the sort of stuff that we've done here that we, you can really see the immediate tangible results from. Yeah, just to finalize that, I mean, I think our experience of working with the care homes was um, genuinely really, really pleased, delighted with the support, the 
engagement i thought it would be very difficult and actually it felt really positive and very good so i think if um going forward if we can all find ways of perhaps seeing that as a platform where research of all sorts could take place but particularly around the diagnostics so thanks very much yeah i mean i think i, I echo adam's point about nihr wanting to do more in this space and i think there's an aspect of capacity development i mean i think you're relatively unusual and having an interest in this and it may take time to grow the expertise and people. I was also at that meeting yesterday and delighted to see yeah. um, Laura Shalcross from UCL has been awarded a yeah. research professorship, which I think will probably have some of this as part of her remit, which is, you know, one, one small yes. in the so right it's, direction. So Laura's, senior, Laura's research professors from ISI, I think, are both indicators of the fact that we need to be pushing in yeah. that direction. Um, you know, and Laura and I are working on a you know, further piece of work around, uh, uh, you know, um, not... not uh, um, multiplex testing and or um, the sort of yeah. uh, diagnostics but around asymptomatic testing uh, uh, in care homes and what, how you actually build the processes around that so that i guess the key challenge will be that as we actually do the work how we hold on to the care homes and you know build research capacity around them rather than just letting them disappear off across the, the horizon again maybe if i could just ask you one last question before we break and, and i think the bit that i always struggle with slightly in in sort of being peripheral to some of these conversations around this kind of work is understanding the motivations of different nursing homes going forward to actually provide this care and whether it's coming out of their own pockets if they're a private provider or whether it's going to be funded centrally and how how that shapes what they're interested in implementing what the motivations are yeah you, uh, so but i think i think it depends it varies from technology to technology and study to, to to study and i think this is where actually the expertise of the researchers in terms well there's two parts to this first of all over time you get to know the sector really well so that you can actually sort of almost sense how to pitch stuff in order to get care homes in, involved. The second thing is obviously um, with, when you're working with a sector that's as different from healthcare as, as the care home sector is, and you know, we also do some work with domiciliary care, which is a different sector. Again, uh, you have to have your usual PPI, uh, but you also have to have your kind of sectoral engagement kind of committee as well. And so we'll be, when we're working up this type of work, we'll be doing work with you know, PPI who are actually either residents or relatives or lay members of the public, but also doing work with care home managers and owners to see what is it that's in this for you. Um, and, and so for, you know, for this type of stuff that we did during the pandemic, uh, the, there was a sense of um, they would do anything that would give them a better handle on what was actually going on inside their care home setting uh, and anything that would uh, help them to deliver better care. So this was just genuinely motivated by driving up standards. Now that meant giving us some free staff time, which was effectively costing them money and opportunity and they were entirely happy to do that um, and, it, and it's been similar with other research studies we've done in the past around say false prevention for example they'll give us heaps of staff time which is a, you know a, a donation in kind if you like from the organization uh, in order to drive up standards and quality of care and uh, and so that uh, genuinely comes from the same place as the nhs usually so long as they're not taking a major financial hit uh, that you know that, that will damage their organization they'll support what they can uh, and there's another uh, piece at the moment um uh, which we're working on, which is around a minimum data set for long-term care homes called the DATCHA study, and that's led from Claire Goodman in uh, Hertfordshire. And the motivation around that one's a little bit different, but quite interesting, which is that post-pandemic, there's almost a guarantee that there will be a minimum data set imposed on care homes by government at some point in the next you know, couple of years. And care homes have two options, either to passively receive that or to work with researchers to inform what goes into the minimum data set. And so the minute we say you know, to care homes, this is your chance to actually you know, leverage that discussion and make, make sure that what's in there is feasible and, and makes sense to you, they're, they're, they're on board you know, before you can sort of finish the sentence. Uh, so I think, you know, um, giving them a seat at the table is important to them. Driving up quality of care is important to them. The biggest risk will be, uh, 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 you know, that it's financially unfeasible or more importantly, actually, that the opportunity cost of being involved in research is so great that they just can't deliver day-to-day -day care. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, lots of things that we'd like to pull off. I'm sorry you can't stay later, but um, no, if sorry. We're, the break, um, we're gonna hear from Rashmita about a multiplex diagnostic, which may be of some relevance to some of the things you've so what, what I'll do is I'll get feedback on that from Pete and Massimo, but uh, <laughs> uh, if anybody wants to discuss further outside this meeting, uh, just get in touch. And I'm sure we can have a slightly more long, uh, uh, you know, in-depth conversation on the day when I'm not also on call for the wards. So uh, um, thanks for that. Well, thanks for making the time. So we'll have a break here. Um, and then I think we'll just we'll return as we are on the schedule at uh, quarter two sharp um, for Rashmita. Oh, is that okay, Noako? Yeah, so shall we get back to 2.45 or? Perfect, is, yeah. yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
Cool. Okay, we'll have a, a 10 minutes break then. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you very much. No problem. Bye bye.
is Rash Mita on the? Hi, Graham. Can you see me? Can you hear I can me? now. Yes, lovely. Okay, great. Okay, great. Thank you. great. <laughs> Good. Well, I mean, it's hard to tell who's still here, but at least it looks like we haven't lost anybody over the break. And I won't ask everyone to put their cameras on and try and find out. But um, I think we heard from Adam just before we broke about some of the working care homes and I think his particular interest in, in multiplex diagnostics. And actually, that might lead quite nicely to, to Rashmita's presentation, although I don't know exactly what you're going to cover. But um, Rashmita, um, well, perhaps you could just introduce yourself and how you sit with DNA Nudge, but um, yeah. those less familiar then uh, this is a company that spun out of Imperial um, some time ago and has had a close collaboration, uh, particularly during COVID. And so Reshmita is going to talk to us about novel multiple applications of, of new technology. I'll pass over to you. Thanks. And you just need to do the slideshow, I think. Yeah, I think I think Ankur did describe how to do that. And I'm still struggling. <laughs> if I can have instruction again, Ankur. Um, it was... It was the bottom button first and then... The the, 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 bottom 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 bottom. the slideshow, I can't see it on my screen. Yeah, um, so I go. think yeah, next the, to the slider. Down the the, is the bottom yeah. down, you think? Down. Yeah, yeah, presentation modes uh, fast, I think, at the very bottom. See where the slider is on the bottom right. So just to the left of that. Yeah, let me see. Did that work? Yeah, perfect. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Graham, for this opportunity to be here this afternoon. Actually, it was really great uh, listening to a few of the uh, speaker earlier. And um, um, before I start anything, just quickly give me you know, one minute introduction about myself. Uh, I'm Rashmita, and I lead the asset development team at Natch. And I have been in diagnostic from last 20 years. So <laughs> it's really great opportunity to be here. Although when Graham was asking to talk about infectious disease, I was thinking, well, you know, we are not really fully into infectious disease yet, and do I have substantial amount to talk? But after listening to Adam, I think, yes, um, probably a right forum where I can contribute a little bit. And, um, you know, it will give us a really good opportunity how this uh, point of care device nudge can be a diagnostic tool in multiple applications. So, yeah. And um, I will also talk about a little bit, uh, you know, how, we, how um, what was the nudge initial uh, intents on developing the technology and how we have gone through the corona uh, pandemic um, scenario and what you have learned from that and where we stand today, taking all this experience of corona, uh, how did you evolve from there and where we stand and the technology point of view and what is our future plans, uh, especially focusing to the infectious disease. So um, it is not necessary that we are only into diagnostic or uh, infectious disease, but you know it can be applicable to multiple things. Like I have some examples of um, like uh, companion diagnostic or oncology in that matter. So it's mainly the platform we will be talking about today. So um, you know Chris is not here, unfortunately. I think he would have been done a fantastic job to explain the technology to you, but. I will try my best as well. <laughs> it is his baby. It is his evaluation of his thoughts and work uh, through Imperial. And uh, around in 2015, he started the nudge. <clears throat> Basically, um, in a 2015, it was, uh, sorry, it was, it was um, by Maria and Chris, uh, the founder, and uh, they started this uh, Little, they wanted to do a make a little device which basically can do an entire genetic testing uh, for nutrition. The idea was uh, to make it, um, you know, better health, better uh, give, provide a, a tool, applicable directly tool to the people which can make, uh, you know, choose, let them choose what a nutrition value or nutrition product they can ultimately eat. It is not about dieting. It was not about dieting. It was not about recommending you a healthier, uh, you know, like a, a replace a banana to a biscuit, that sort of thing. It was just about nudging, you know, on a daily life, uh, depending on your genetic profile. So, um, but, you know, any diagnostic test or any kind of genetic test you do, it takes a uh, longer time, uh, expensive, or you have to send these samples to the lab. Uh, so he wanted to replace that entire thing, lab on a box sort of thing, so that it can be done quickly and in, in a retail environment or anywhere in that world matter, you know, in a corporate store or in a uh, in any kind of um, home, home, home setup or lab setup, you name it, everywhere it can run and give you a quick actionable results rather than sending 
sending it to lab and getting 20 pages of report. So um, that was his intention and he started that. And around 2019, we launched the first product on the nutrition panel. We did it and I will talk a little bit, just a quick touch on the nutrition panel. But uh, during 19, uh, 2019, we started our first launch product in uh, Covent Garden here before, uh, just before the pandemic and uh, when pandemic started, Corona started, I think he got a, a further in, in, indication from the government that if we can uh, quickly do a detour of this technology and see, at that time we were focusing only on the DNA and we quickly manipulate this, you know, with the cartridge only, that manipulation happened for the COVID and we managed to get the COVID signal first time. It was actually an incredible journey for me especially uh, because I'm there from the beginning and we managed to get this um, COVID product around 2020 and launch into a um, couple of hospital initially to do the validation. Of course, all these things are uh, only with the collaboration with our immediate um, hospitals nearby or Imperial or, you know, in a North England pathology and uh, St. Mary hospitals. Then up to 2020-21, we were fully busy into uh, Corona and we got some help and grants uh, to deploy it across the UK. I'll talk a little bit more about all these things. And then where we stand today is uh, following the COVID, we develop a multiplex uh, for flu A, flu B, RSV as well. And uh, that's as a product, you know, diagnostic product, uh, which, we are, um, uh, which we are able to uh, deliver it now. So during that process, we do have other works like, you know, we have other panels apart from the nutrition, we have some uh, other panels to develop as well. But uh, ever since we have experienced Corona, we are getting into more and more interested in a diagnostic and uh, we have some proof of concept, uh, both in the field of virus, virus as well as in uh, bacteria. So let me quickly go through it. This is the original product, uh, the, uh, the SNP panel. We had it, uh, selective step panel on um, selected or based on obesity or salt or caffeine or fat metabolism couple of very interesting feature related to um, uh, body physiology and we could identify these snips just with a saliva samples um, on a box you know that was the technology we developed and it is not necessarily gives you a report but it just gives you the actionable items for example this has been linked to micronutrients of the a product which are available in supermarket and uh, and then it will give you the uh, nudging it will give you that you know this product is red or uh, green for you so the red means depending on your genotyping it has been calculated with a base of artificial intelligent uh, based algorithm developed it is choosing you a product for you in a supermarket so instead of taking a type of biscuit it will give you a b type of biscuit it, if in case it finds more salt or more uh, you know uh, a fact in that depending on your genotype profiling. So over the time, if you are you know, restricting yourself uh, all this micronutrient component, it probably gives you a long-term benefits. And uh, that was the intention and ide um, identity behind this product when we launched. And then we also carrying on one uh, clinical trial just to see whether really this is effective and how effective it is uh, nudging people over time and uh, considering that um, you know how this uh, how this uh, nudging or dieting is helping you. You know, healthy diet is helping you over over time. So, and, uh, Professor Nick Oliver, he's our lead prof uh, lead PI, and uh, this is about to finish. Interesting because in between we had stopped for two years, and then now it's in November we are disclosing the results, and we are all excited to see how nudge has made an impact on this um, you know entire uh, clinical studies. So, um, uh, you know the. I will talk a little bit about the technology itself. It is like a box, uh, box on a uh, lab on a box, and it has two applications. As I said, it can directly give you nutrition or in that matter, any other, there are the pipeline products we have, but it gives you actionable results. But at the other side, during the COVID, we learned that we can also apply it to the diagnostic platform. You know, uh, It is the same platform, same technology, but um, one will give you results, yes or no, another will give you what is that recommended for you, depending on what setup we are applying this for. So this is my favorite bit because I work in the lab and I'm a scientist. So I will just show you this, uh, you know, this is, um, this is a very simple lab. Uh, you know, that's the cartridge of a hand size and uh, you just put a swab, whether it is a skincare, a nutrition or um, 
uh, nasal nasopharyngeal sample. Sometimes you have liquid sample also you can directly pipette to the swab chamber. Once you put that, this is exactly a stew box like like a box, a PCR machine you can say, which will do your extraction. Entire extraction is uh, done in this cartridge. This cartridge is loaded with all site uh, all site of extractions and uh, purification systems, and it will ended up in giving you a purified samples um, to the amplification unit, which is basically a you know deposited primer and probes. Uh, of multiplexing, whether it is single or multiplex, up to 72 wells we can amplify in one go. And uh, when Corona started, we all we did is that because we had a DNA test, we changed quickly the master mix, lyophilized master mix to a RT based master mix, and we managed to change all the important uh, targets during that time, whether it is um, uh, um, IP2, IP4, or N1, N2, N3, or E gene. You know, we could manage putting it all together where other tests probably doing one or two, along with the human RNA control. That's how the system works. And uh, once uh, once you insert the to the box, it will automatically redo the uh, redo the uh, signals um, after the amplification of the fluorescent probes, and uh, it gets uh, converted to algorithm on the cloud and gives you the direct yes or no answer on the iPad. So it's a very simple procedure. Just put the cartridge and walk away with a button on, and then the results will come to you automatically. Um, during that, uh, during uh, you know COVID, after developing this cartridge, we did a validation again. Thanks to Graham, he made us open Imperial uh, and uh, Saint Mary to you know during this pandemic time. We were so scared, but we are managing getting the 400 plus samples uh, for the quick early validation within three to six months of time during Corona. We could manage this, and uh, with uh, you know we could manage to even publish this paper on the Lancet. Uh, that was on the nasopharyngeal samples, but eventually we developed, we validated a protocol on um, sputum or gob, we say, you know, and then uh, dip in the swab and put it in the cartridge as well. And that was um, even help us in multiplexing samples together because these cartridges can do only one test at a time, but with saliva, we could multiplex with dipping methodology. And that also we published on the BMC infectious disease. But following that, we did um, we did pass UCAS as a diagnostic lab, and we could offer these services to you know journey. Uh, I think these travel certificates, or even uh, people who want, were interested to just know COVID positive or negative, we managed to offer this test till today. And uh, after that, you know, we quickly tried to lunch because um, that was the UK um, government need. And uh, that's me actually very early days going to hospital and giving training to people. It is hardly any 10 minutes training. You need not much hands on at all. You don't need to be very um, skillful a nurse or a scientist on that matter. A retail person like in the left can do. And we do have a retail shop where we can offer this COVID as a test. So all we wanted to say is that it's a very simple thing because following that, we almost implemented this thing around 105 NHS as well as private hospital across the UK and uh, Northern Ireland. And up to today, we almost completed more than half a million tests um, on COVID itself. If you do a comparison, like you know, Adam was talking about this, uh, that uh, you know uh, there are so many players in the market, especially today. In these early days, it was different. However, the cost is still a driving factor, and easy. Um, there are so many factors: user point of view, or simplicity point of view, or portability point of view, delivering the data, accuracy. All these things matters. But you know, if a quick look, uh, whether it is um, you know um, other player in the market are very good as well. However, we uh, with a pulling technology, we could this technology to cost effective as low as almost 10 pound um, and uh, you know the the best part is that it is because a direct sample to swab you just put it and then it is secured for uh, you know that that in chances of infection is very less and it is a one-time disposable one so all these things make us a little bit more unique compared to any other platform in the market and um, and then that's how when we saw that we are successful in COVID, we started to explore a little bit more uh, avenue, you know, that whether uh, whether it can really do some other uh, other sample types coming from a genetic uh, background, you know, when we saw human DNA can be converted to viral RNA detection, why not the other, uh, you know, detection panel we can do? So we explore a little bit other uh, scenario. And the excellent feature for any diagnostic uh, which is needed today, which should be less time, laugh-free, 
or you know point of care a diagnostic or multiplexing capacity and um, you know so everywhere in the world can possibly be done without uh, a lot of setting up those are the salient feature makes us thought that okay let's explore uh, more into a little bit you know other dimensions so i have some couple of examples how we are uh, doing but the first one we um, attack is respiratory viral panel as it is obvious that after covid we have to see if we can put flu a flu b and rsv uh, to bear minimum four targets we were also thinking to put some more we have not added but this is the panel we recently got ctda approved and uh, again, during this corona, we developed this. Uh, we have a couple of targets from each, as I said, because our multiplex capacity is a bit more, uh, up to 72 as so we could uh, apply into the cartridge. And um, with the clinical samples, uh, with help of Luke and Gary, we got, uh, got it validated in hospital setup, set almost uh, beyond 95% sensitivity and almost 100% specificity for all the targets. And this is kind of ready to go to hospital uh, now. Uh, following that, you know, just uh, to give you some bit of aspects and the uh, infectious disease, we did some activities, you know, some STIs and HPVs. Uh, and along with that, also, we were trying, if at all, we can do some um, drug resistance target, basically MRSA. This, these were uh, developed as a point of care proof of concept. I'll give you a little bit more background when we started this. Again, this is a collaborative work with uh, Rachel and Mike. Uh, and uh, we started STIs uh, to see if we can detect. Our initial target was four, and uh, um, gonorrhea and chlamydia are the first two things we have done some clinical testing so far. And uh, we are uh, very happy to see that um, you know, we could manage whether it is urine or swab or, uh, you know, a direct swab or a swab dipped in a, a VTM UTM or, um, you know, a, a, a urine, simply urine rather than, you know, even uh, centrifuging it or making it more, uh, make, making it more compact, compact. And we are able to manage to get it equivalent to the results of a competitor uh, platform. Uh, we have not gone to the other two targets, but eventually we'll move on. But this is just an example that, whether this DNN as a technology can adapt to different sample type and can adapt to bacteria as well as can adapt to virus. But the interesting bit is, you know, what I wanted to point out is um, it is not necessary. Um, we are more competitive to the market or, you know, some some panel in the market are very huge, like Biofire, for example, in a big time bacterial panel we have, or we go to Cepheid, you get a lot of um, you know, um, uh, uh, applicable parameters there. But the thing is what we can help us that uh, if we have a defined uh, smaller panel, Nudge will be able to help you very quickly and which are, uh, which are basically in a clinical application. So we did have talk about this with uh, Mike and Rachel and we were thinking to develop smaller panel, uh, whether it is gonorrhea plus antibiotic resistance together to give you a direct uh, clinical implication immediately rather than going for diagnosis first and whether you need another test for antibiotic resistance. So uh, if we combined, and because we can't do a bigger panel, we can do only smaller panel. If we uh, more focus on exact smaller panel, we will be able to uh, do, do a bit better diagnosis and clinical applicable uh, products. You know? So these are some examples we are working on, on a smaller panel uh, discussion with uh, clinicians. So knowing that we are able to detect virus, we are able to detect uh, bacteria, and we are able to detect human uh, samples, we thought we also will explore, uh, you know, currently we are working with Manchester uh, on a Manchester hospitals, and we are uh, going to do a clinical validation as well, basically on a diabetic food panel. You know, this Again, it is a very focused panel. We are not expanding uh, as much as a culture can give or as much as a bigger platform can give. But we are trying to just make it a smaller panel to give you more answerable test um, as quickly as possible, because the test is not more than 90 minutes. And uh, if you want to know a quick results before even going for a further discussion or further uh, decision, then we could do that. So some of these targets are gram positive, gram negative and resistance marker, and we could detect all of them as a proof of concept, but we'll see how the clinical trials happens for us. And uh, <laughs> Of course, all these things are possible only through, uh, you know, helping hand and a uh, lot of discussion with clinicians very early days. A lot of other people have contributed significantly for our um, validation of the trials until today for uh, 
viral and non-viral panel, we, we have collaborative approach with a lot of NHS hospitals. So thank you so much for all your help. And I'll be open for questions. Thank you, Rashmita. That, that's excellent. Um, I think, are you able to stay for, for the rest of the session? Okay. I think what yeah. we'll do is we'll come to Q&A at, um, at the end, and I think that we'll, we can bring you back for that. That would be great. Sure. I'm sure lots of questions coming through. Um, I'm hoping that if you can stop sharing, then yeah. um, while Sharani is loading up, I suppose I would just say one thing. I think that the, you know, the, 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 the serendipity in some of this development at times of pressure is, is sometimes overlooked. And I think one of the things that was interesting about your product for COVID development was that, um, that it took a very small swab, a paediatric swab. And actually, yes. that was a big, big advantage at the time when there was a huge pressure on other standard swabs. That we wouldn't have been able to get hold of and you were able to do, do that development with pediatric swabs which was i think just yes. luck right and that's yeah. that, that <laughs> that's was, the one Graham. yeah, yeah that, that, that doesn't look very pediatric but maybe my camera's good <laughs> great no. yeah, okay look thank you very much and um i think we've got a couple of talks which we'll do back to back and then we'll take questions at the end and i think um the next two are sort of linked by the fact that they relate to our biomedical research center in particular um and for those of you who are closer to these things you'll be aware that we're imminently waiting for the renewal of our biomedical research centers which have been sat on ministerial desks now for some months um but the previous funding over the last 10 15 years has has really given us important infrastructure which has helped uh, in collaborations on a whole range of things, um, including things like the work that Rashmita presents, many other things too. Um, so I'm very grateful to my esteemed colleague, uh, Professor Shuskandan, who is a clinical academic in infectious diseases, who's going to talk to us about some of that infrastructure locally, um, both about a bioresource project and, um, uh, and the laboratory resource that's been supported around it. And I can see your slide, Sharani. I can't see you. I don't know if that's my... Really? I can see me. Can you hear me? Yeah, no, I can see you now. You're, you're there now. Okay. Lovely. I'll, Perhaps I'll I needed to talk to activate the camera. I think, I think it it's did. a very expensive Macintosh, I thought. Okay, well, um, hi, everybody. I'm Sharani Sriskanan. So I'm an adult ID physician, but I also um, run um, these two facilities. So I'm going to tell you a bit, a bit about the Leonard and Dora Colebrook Laboratory and then about BioAid, which is a bioresource. And both of these are available for people at Imperial, both in the Trust and the College, to access. So the Colebrook Laboratory is um, has been set up really through a single capital award to our BRC and during the last BRC around about 2018 of about 2.6 million pounds. And the idea was to set up a laboratory that will help us combat um, the threat of antimicrobial resistance in its broadest sense. Um, and the point of this um, uh, laboratory, which is sited at the Charing Cross Hospital, is to enhance access to clinical material, which means that the fact it's juxtaposed with the main clinical lab is key. And that is why it's on the fifth floor of the laboratory block, which is kind of round the back of Charing Cross Hospital, if you're familiar with this. And it has its own laboratory manager, Stephanie Dark, who works um, half time. Um, so what's inside the lab? Well, lots of stuff that you'd need to do if you want to do um, research microbiology, but in a clinical setting. It's got class two microbiological safety cabinets, fume hood, it's got a separate molecular room, CO2 incubators. It's even got an anaerobic incubator, which isn't quite set up yet. Centrifuges, minus 80 freezer, storage space, teaching microscopes and qPCR. But also I think something we have found incredibly important in the past is access to a Brooker Malditoff of the same scale and um, cleverness that is used by the diagnostic lab, which means that you can now identify at the species level colonies from a plate, which we weren't previously able to do in the research setting. And it was quite a faff to um, engage with our clinical colleagues uh, to use their facilities. So this is available for researchers. How do you do that? Well, you contact um, Stephanie, the lab manager, via the website. That's the um, website I've put up there, which is the websites um, managed by the BRC, who hold the funding for the lab. And there's a project request form, which basically asks you for a brief project outline. What do you want to do? Um, do what are the safety implications of what you want to do? What equipment you might need? How much space? How much time? And so on. So it's all actually quite straightforward. And why the Colebrook Lab? Just a little bit of history. The point about the Colebrooks is that they are 
um, born and brought up, as it were. They are our own, our very own imperial um, sibling celebrities. So Leonard Colebrook was famous for introducing sulfonamides to the world in a clinical trial in 1936. So 10 years before penicillin was ever available, demonstrated the benefits of antibacterial chemotherapy to everybody. And he then went on to become well known for, for managing burns and um, influencing government policy. Uh, but he's rarely mentioned in the history of antibacterials. And we thought it was fitting that a laboratory, which was basically set up to um, combat AMR, should celebrate the name of the man who first really introduced antibacterial chemotherapy to the UK. And the other thing to mention is his equally important but less famous sister, Dora Colebrook, who was also a medical microbiologist, and she conducted the very earliest molecular investigations of hospital-acquired infection, in particular purple sepsis, caused by a bug um, close to my heart, group A streptococcus. And her work really paved the way for major government um, policies on controlling spread of infection in hospitals. Maybe two centuries after Semmelweis showed the same thing, but really she provided the molecular evidence for it. So that's the background to why it's the Colebrook Lab. So what's what's already in there? There's a number of uh, projects that have happened in the in the Colebrook Lab. Um, one of which was, of course, the London Biofoundry setting up their COVID testing platform right at the start of the pandemic, and that was hugely successful and was then rolled out to the main diagnostic laboratory. And I just want to tell you about the um, project that is hosted um, on a more or less permanent basis by the Colbrook Lab, and that is the BioAid Bioresource. So this is a bioresource in adult infectious disease samples, and it's a collaboration between um, the Imperial BRC and the BRC at UCLH, and now also includes um, the Oxford BRC and Birmingham. It started in 2014, uh, in the lab block, and then it moved to the new Colbrook lab in 2020. And just to summarize what it is, it is a bioresource of samples from adults admitted with suspected sepsis. And I'll mention what those are in a moment. But its overall aim, uh, set out in the ethical approval for it as a tissue bank, is to help develop diagnostics, biomarkers, vaccines, and new antibiotics. So, provided your research is aiming to um, achieve something in that kind of aim list, uh, it's likely that the bioresource can help you. Um, and that's um, Maddie Norsadegi, who's the um, UCLH project lead. So what's in the BioAid Biobank? Well, there's patient RNA from the point of admission. So the moment they first arrive in hospital, patient serum, patient DNA, and pathogens, clinically relevant pathogens from those patients linked to patient level data. And this is all stored within the Colebrook um, uh, laboratory. Uh, and as I said, the RNA and the serum are from the point of admission. So they're really quite unique. Uh, and if you contrast that with, for example, what Isaric was able to collect during the pandemic, Isaric had to um, consent patients in a, after, after diagnosis was confirmed. Whereas this um, bioresource is collecting samples before we know what's wrong with the patient, which might seem an inefficient thing to do, and a lot of people think it's inefficient, but actually it's hugely valuable. So what happens is when a patient um, presents to the emergency department, if a clinician suspects infection, they may well take a blood culture. And uh, as, as shown here by these two blood culture bottles on the top left. And what happens at the same time is the clinician or the nurse also takes an additional um, two mils of blood into a tempest tube, um, which would not normally be taken along with all the routine samples. And then there is a process of deferred consent whereby a patient is asked in the next working day for consent for us to keep all of these samples, including the routine blood samples, because we can extract DNA from the um, EDTA sample and we can retain the serum from the clinical chemistry sample without needing any further blood tests. And I would say that 99% of people give their consent. If the patient is unable to give consent, for example, they lack capacity, they're too ill, or in fact they passed away, we can get the consent from their next of kin. And then those samples are, there, uh, are either extracted for DNA and RNA or serum separated and stored in the Colebrook laboratory. 
So what's in BioAid? What sorts of patients have samples there? This is a snapshot. I'm afraid it's from 2016, but deliberately pre-pandemic because things are a bit different now, obviously. And you can see that the vast majority of samples, almost half of them are from patients with lower respiratory tract infection, either influenza-like illness or pneumonia. And then the other big chunks are from patients with bacteremia and sepsis, urosepsis, skin and soft tissue infection, and patients with fever of unknown origin. And being adults, a large number of those uh, fever of unknown origin may not have an infection at all. But I think this um, is a realistic representation of what does present to hospital as potential infection. And that's why adults with fever are such a, a diagnostic conundrum. Um, COVID had an enormous effect on us because, of course, we had been collecting quite happily, minding our own business, and then something very bad happened, as, as you will all be aware, uh, in March 2020. And I think you can see that big spike in samples that happened to us uh, without us really asking for it to happen at all. And that reflects a number of patients having blood cultures taken, i.e. were admitted with suspected COVID because we had a, a COVID care set. Uh, we were we had literally just moved to the new lab, but we were fortunate that research support staff were released from other studies to help us. So we doubled our lab staff. Uh, we had volunteers helping with remote consenting and data entry. We had to undergo numerous rapid ethical amendments to allow us to continue. But it was a valuable um, exercise in um in survival really for us because we really made were able to take advantage of the fact we were collecting at the time of the pandemic and we were able to produce samples during the pandemic and then be able to compare them with samples from before the pandemic and just to give you some examples very briefly before I stop in terms of use of the RNA samples these have been subject to RNA seq looking at patients with viral bacterial infections all that group of patients who aren't infected but have a fever and um, we've been able to undertake um, differential gene expression analyses and come up with a signature of um, viral infection that has been validated using RT-PCR by this group of people shown here, Mersini, Jesus, and uh, the clinical side was led by Ho Kwang Li uh, to produce a three gene signature that is really actually very good at identifying viral infections in patients. And it also works in COVID. So had we had this at, in the early part of 2020, we would have been in a better position to spot the people with viral infections at an earlier stage. So it's a biomarker for viral infection. And then similarly, Ravi Mehta, who was another clinician scientist, wanted to ask whether it was possible to find a biomarker that was soluble, a bit like a sort of CRP for viral infection. And um, he teamed up with the National Phenome Center and BioAid to look at patient serum and was able to identify a single biomarker, an antiviral metabolite, DDHC, that really separated patients with viral infections, including those with COVID, from all of the others. So really kind of showing the value of having these samples and having collected them before a pandemic happens, as well as uh, during. And then finally, um, obviously, not to forget about the pathogens that are being collected. While the National Reference Laboratory collects pathogens that are interesting or unusual, or dangerous, um, BioAid is collecting routinely the bacteria that cause infections in patients that come to hospital, which means that um, it is able to provide to researchers bacteria with um, defined phenotypes, but in a sensible clinical context. So not just the weird bacteria, but also the ones that are causing routine infections. And this is a good example of that, whereby urinary tract E. coli, the commonest cause of um, UTI, uh, we actually don't know the mechanisms of resistance to the antibiotic that GPs are supposed to use, which is nitrofurantoin. So we were able to source nitrofurantoin resistant E. coli, which are not routinely looked for or tested for in bacteremia isolates, and identify the molecular basis for resistance in not only Imperial, but then in the whole of the UK. And these bacteria are now going to be used as reference bacteria uh, for use in a test being rolled out by UKHSA. It's a really fabulous work um, led by Yuan and also supported by the BioAid biomedical scientist Irabana. So um, how do you access BioAid samples? 
there's a governance process like for anything um which is um the governance committee comprises the brc leads for each of the brcs who participate there's a sample access form um, where you simply need to outline your project rationale and you access it through the um, BioAid website, which is there and which you can find on the BRC website too. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed. Brilliant. Thank you, Sharani. Um, that's really clear. I, I know you might have to head across the park, but are you okay to stay for the Q&A? In, in yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Okay. Well, look, in that case, we might just move to, to Angina Bad and Angina, are you there? Lovely. That, and um, Angela is just going to tell us uh, briefly about another part of the BRC supported infrastructure. And this sort of complements some of the things that Sharani was just talking about. And this relates to the Molecular Diagnostics Unit, which is a UCAS accredited academic lab focused on infections. So, um, Angela, over to you. And yeah, you, just, you just do the slideshow. I think you'll be. I've clicked on it. It doesn't seem to be. Other again. You have to do this thing at the top left, but uh, yeah, and then you, what was it? Someone said, yeah, swap there. There you go. That should work. Swap. Okay. Brilliant. Great. Okay. Um, so thank you for inviting me to speak today um, and giving the MDU an opportunity to provide a little insight into the great work that the team's been doing. Um, so I'd like to start with a brief background about the MDU. Um, it's an established service that's been running for nearly, well, more than 20 years now, and we specialise in molecular diagnostic testing in virology and other, and other branches of microbiology. And these tests have actually been developed in-house um, as research tools within our research department and then subsequently been validated as um, diagnostic methods that are then some of these later being accredited. So the service, the service was first set up by Professor Myra McClure and um, Professor Jonathan Weaver, and now it is led by Professor Graham Taylor. And it was originally established for the diagnosis of neonatal HIV infection by the detection of um, HIV genes in proviral DNA. Since then, the test had actually moved on to next generation testing, um, where a more informative method was applied to fill in any gaps that was seen several years ago. Um, and this was through viral load detection of RNA, and then more recently to uh, sequencing of the HIV virus. Um, so today, the MDU has expanded its scope to include further assays, and they've been successfully accredited through UCAS under the ISO 15198 standards. Um, and in parallel to this, we also carry out some academic and commercial projects. Um, and some of these I'll be talking to you about shortly. Um, so the accredited diagnostic tests that are currently provided through the MDU um, they began with bloodborne viruses. And I've just mentioned HIV testing. So what we currently do at the moment is um, resistance testing using next generation sequencing of protease, reverse transcriptase, and the integrase genes of HIV. The method is incredibly sensitive and we are able to detect copies um, down to about 20 RNA copies per mil. We also offer some HCV and genotype, the HCV genotyping resistance testing. Um, and this is basically because the, some of the HCV directly acting antigens, I'm sorry, and agents are um, restricted to certain HCV genotypes. Um, detecting these mutations in viral genomes, a prediction of the susceptibility of the virus to currently licensed drugs, and this highlights the importance of these tests. The test itself involves the sequencing of three different targets. So that's NS3, NS5A, and NS5B of HCV. We also um, offer HTV, HTLV detection. So the MDU is strongly invested in the HTLV assays. And these two, the two that are provided, that are accredited are HTLV DNA qPCR, which looks at um, pro viral load me measurement for the diagnosis, prognosis, and monitoring of the disease and treatment in patients that are infected with HIV. 
HTLV1 and 2. Um, and we also offer typing to distinguish between HTLV1 and 2 through PC amplification of the text gene sequence of HTLV. So over the years, um, the MDU has successfully added and enhanced its portfolio of assays, allowing us to remain ahead of the field in diagnostic testing and clinical monitoring and to provide the highest quality of patient care. This was particularly evident through the pandemic as our expertise was applied in response to the COVID outbreak. So as you know, in January, January 2020, I think most people were rushing to look for SARS-CoV-2 assays. And uh, we were definitely one of those who rapidly added SARS-CoV-2 assays to our portfolio. And this was both viral and antibody detection. The viral load assay was actually fully developed by March 2020, and we had received NHS samples by, Mar by April. We were actually one of the first labs to be fully accredited for the SARS-CoV-2 viral load assay. Um, and this process normally takes several months and was achieved within just a few of that due to the expertise and knowledge of the UCAS processes. So we had um, applied for the extension to scope in May and got assessed in June and by July we were put forward for um, approval of accreditation. On the back of that, what we had is also a DHSC funded project, which was the lighthouse testing um, with um, the support of the biofoundry. So you can see one of the um, robots that we were using there, that's the Felix. Um, during the pandemic, there was quite uh, an issue with obtaining any kind of RNA extraction kits um, and platforms and the biofoundry provided us with the Felix that actually helped a lot in optimizing the assays. Um, alongside the lighthouse testing, we also did some Imperial staff and student testing, and that just was completed in June of this year. Um, as I mentioned, we did actually have a look at the serology testing, and this, was, this assay was also fully developed by June 2020, and the NHS samples that actually began being tested then as well. Uh, again, one of the first labs to be UCAS accredited for the antibody assay as well. Um, so during this time, we also had um, adopted the sequencing workflow from the biofoundry. And uh, this is whole genome analysis of SARS-CoV-2 using uh, next generation sequencing. And this allowed for the rapid detection of emerging variants and helped guide any restrictions within the organizations. Um, here we can see in the graph below is the detection of the variants throughout 2021. And characterizing these samples provided us with uh, a valuable archive of samples that were then used for future research and developmental work. So the resources and the expertise of the MDU has enabled us, uh, enabled a number of successful collaborations through both commercial and academic projects. Um, we have had projects with um, DNA Nudge, which was spoken about earlier, and um, Rashmita kindly mentioned that we were involved in a lot of the validation that was um, put forward for their PCR-based detection assay. Um, also intelligent fingerprinting, which involved validation of uh, lateral flow tests of um, SARS-CoV-2 using saliva samples, and um, Oxford Nanoimaging, which was a UK um, innovation funded project. Um, and we were involved in using the category three laboratories to carry out some refinement of their assays. Um, we're also involved in various academic projects, um, one of which was REACT, which you've probably heard, already heard of. Um, there were some validation assays carried out for that. Um, and some of the new stuff that we're actually looking into now is the sepsis studies, where we're seeing the um, rapid diagnosis of bacterial and fungal infection in patients that require intensive care with suspected susceptibility in septicemia. And, enable guided treatment, therefore trying to stop antibiotics if we can. 
Um, we do have some HTLV assays as well, which include T cell clonality assays, which has been de developed by Dr. Rowan, and also some markers of neuroinflammation and neuron neuronal, neuronal damage. Um, in addition to that, there have been some projects that we have in the pipeline at the moment, and these include um, projects involving flu A and B antivirals, and also some diagnostics for human challenge studies involving, uh, involving SARS-CoV-2. Um, so just to summarize, the MDU is a fully accredited um, lab to ISO 15189 standards. Um, we are very experienced in setting up rapidly the new assays to be included in the scope for accreditation, and this was evidenced by the rapid response we had to SARS-CoV-2. Um, our previous projects have allowed us for the development of a valuable archive of range of samples that have been advantageous in aiding the development of novel technologies to support local clinical trials. And these again include validation of clinical assays and devices. Our resources, um, such as our category three laboratories, the access to various technologies such as sequencing, flow cytometry and qPCR, and also our experience and expertise are invaluable in allowing for the rapid development of a variety of niche diagnostic assays to be delivered to patients and thereby fast tracking translational medicine. Um, and just to close, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the team. Um, there's been so many people that are, have been involved and been working with the MDU, which I can't really list all of them out here at the moment. Um, but if there is any questions that you may have, or you would like to know a bit more about our projects or what we can do, please contact me. Um, and also you can visit our website um, where I've put the address here for you. Thank you. Brilliant, Asha, thank you very much. Um, if you can stop sharing slides, um, and what I might ask is if those speakers who are still here, if they could put your cameras back on, uh, and please do put questions in the chat and we'll try and curate those. Um, so Rashmita and Sharani, I'm not sure if I can, oh yeah, they, people are re-emerging, that's excellent, thank you. Um, and I think there aren't many questions in the chat at the moment, but maybe if we think about starting around technology and and some of the questions is probably related more to you, Rashmita. I think um, there's a question from Michael. I think that's probably Michael Crone, but there's a question about throughput on the sort of device you've got. So perhaps if you could talk sort of specifically about your own device, but also you know, where, where you see the trade-offs in terms of throughput and what's needed for different settings, um, how, how you see you addressing that. I mean, we've seen Kefid move from you know different scales of machines for different environments through Omni to infinity. So I don't know if you want to just comment on your view on this. Yeah, so we the device we are working is only one, one cartridge at a time and one test, one samples that is. Unless there is a pooling way of doing it, which we did for up to 50 samples we could pull, although we offer only 10 for saliva sample. But for nasal sample, it's only one test at a time, which is taking between 60 to 90 minutes, depend on which panel we are talking about. So uh, the only way to make it multiplex for us is we stack the boxes, you know, the, the nudge boxes I showed you, the suitcase boxes, we stack on each other and we, they go on the row or they, they go in the panel. We almost have 100 boxes and we can multiplex that way. They are um, not as expensive as a PCR machine, they are much cheaper and some rental way of uh, availability there. So there are modality to uh, rent them as well. But unfortunately, it's only one test at a time. So compared to Cepheid, you know, yes, Cepheid can do one or multiple in time, but the Cepheid machine itself is not portable. You know, the, uh, the, the portability of nudge uh, box is bit much easier, you can carry it with hand or you can carry it home or anywhere. That's the only way it is a little bit more, you know, uh, flexible, I would say. And uh, um, it, is, it is not necessarily lab-based, you know, it can be anywhere and it can be done by anybody. So that's the vers versatility we offer. Uh, so I think that's, that's 
that's the positive point uh, if you think about uh, commercial available diagnostic platforms available either they are very big or they need a little bit more expertise or um, you know integration sometimes is a problem where integration is a bit much easier and it's a cloud based one so you can just merge it to any um, like of internet service and you can get the results so um does that answer you? I think it's fair to say where it's been implemented at scale, it's needed a person to curate a, a room with a number of boxes, I think, mm -hmm. hasn't it? And that's been common to a number of other devices yes. I think, that have done a similar thing. I don't, I don't want to let you hog the floor, but there's another question which is quite technical. Maybe if you want to ask briefly, Peter's asking about um, how you how you allowed for the evolving understanding of the importance of um, CT counts, I guess, and, and quantitation of of virus during the evolution of this assay and how you accounted for that in your assay design. I don't know if you can comment. So does that, that do justice to your question, Pete? <laughs> yeah, sensitivity is a major issue. Um, you know, we, we, we initially, when we developed, we didn't think about uh, sensitivity at all. We just thought, can we detect? That was our initial um, way of doing it. And we directly jump into clinical samples and we, uh, we found clinical sample was much easier for us. And when we went back, when things settled a little bit, we started working backward and tried to see what is the sensitivity and uh, where we can match it with commercially available platform, you know. Uh, so um, the sample prep is, uh, you know, it, it it is as accurate as it can do, but it probably can do a bit more better job than what it is doing. Uh, however, the the sensitivity right now is 1000 per ml that is for covid we can uh, go as low as 1000 per ml both in terms of culture as well as uh, commercially available uh, controls available uh, we do have a control uh, we we recommend a lyophilized control rather than liquid control because the platform is usually recommended for a direct swap to samples so we do not have done a lot of validation on liquid samples you know we I do know that it works on VTM, UTM modality as well. But for clinical, uh, you know, the controls you com commercially available are usually in liquid, but there are commercially available uh, controls which are in swab as well, you know, like uh, one cape or a swab. And we develop both, uh, both in liquid as well as in swab. And we recommend a lyophilized product now. It comes with a kit right now, it's a lyophilized version, and the claim is around 1000 per ml. We do, uh, going forward, we are evaluating all sensitivity and we try to match it with uh, which is clinically rele relevant. And we sometimes uh, found that we are not uh, best available commercial kit. For example, you know, you will find kits which are 250 copies per ml. We will not be able to match with them, but uh, probably it's good enough to give you. Uh, sometimes we have seen uh, CT value higher than 35 is a challenge in a borderline cases for us. Uh, 40 certainly is a, uh, you know, no, no. So very occasionally we will detect, but otherwise no. But even 32 to 35 is our cutoff commercial value. Although we do not give a CT value to people, we just say qualitative yes or no. Yeah. Anshan, did you want to come in on that? I was actually going to ask you a, a different question about sequencing. I know we spoke about it a while ago, whether, you know, we would be able to do it or not. I was wondering, did you get anywhere with that? Did you try? No, but uh, one develop, good develop uh, thing has happened recently is that, um, you know, the, the reason why we are not able to take is, you know, we are not able to take fluid out of this. This was the problem, you know, uh, that uh, once cartridge is done, we discard it. And there is a chamber where accumulation of happens, DNA happens, and uh, there is no post-product uh, recovery from this cartridge. I can't recover the post-amplified product because it is less than two microliter in each of these well. It's almost like a micro channel. So all most impossible for us to take out that two microliter, but we are exploring a possibility of taking the template out and we are going for a direct extraction rather than going through a lot of steps. So we are seeing a better recovery, but it's very early to say that whether uh, that will work for sequencing or not, you know, but it's, it remains a challenge <laughs> till our last discussion. <laughs> Right, well, I can just come back to slightly, Graham, because I think it's one of the challenges that we all face, especially when confronted with something new, that very often we're then, and I think Omar might have a comment on this as well, actually, we're then faced with, if you're, um, if you're procuring devices, you can be faced with devices which seem to have very different characteristics, but that's because they're based on a different way of evaluating them, to be honest. 
And I think that causes a lot of complexity for those that are making procurement decisions as to what's best for a particular context of use. And I think COVID has taught us a great deal about how we might want to review procurement decisions. So we had Adam earlier talking about, in the end, lateral flows got everywhere because they were cheap, not necessarily because they were better than other products. And I think that's probably true for all the things that we've looked at, certainly across the sort of um, COVID piece that we had with Condor and that network. And I think in terms of the context of this afternoon's discussions, at some point it would be good to think, are we comparing like with like? And how do we inform those that want to procure devices to make sure that they procure the right devices for the specific context of use? And I think yeah. that's an important point to make. Well, maybe I could take that as an opportunity to broaden out the conversation slightly. I mean, I think that, um, I mean, I guess sort of related to what you're saying, Peter, I think is the use of target product profiles, for example, which became a little bit more front and center during COVID than it had been before. And I think regulators started to look at that. And we've got companies and regulators on this call. So if people want to join in with their, their perspectives, it'd be very helpful. But um I suppose the broader question for all of you um, and whoever wants to pick it up would be about the progress that we made during COVID, which is falling away, I think, and, and which bits are staying with us. I mean, I think clearly there's been a lot of investment, a lot of focus, and some things have been really good, but actually some things are starting to fall away, which we might need. And it'd be useful to think about where people see that and, and if there are examples that we should be trying to, as a, as a group and as a community, trying to sustain more actively. One of you. Can, I, can I keep off a little bit, Graham? Because yeah, I, think, yeah. I think one of the things that, uh, for me, looking back and looking where we are now, I think it's this thing around multiplex testing for um, respiratory infectious diseases. That suddenly has become very much on the table up front. But whether or not we have the resources and whether or not we have the knowledge to really implement it in a way that is going to be you know, worthy um, is much less clear to me. So I don't know whether that's something that others on the call might want to comment on. Well, well uh, I can. I, um, others may. Anyone want to come in on that? I mean, in, in many ways, COVID was much easier, right? Because it, it was all it was relatively binary. I mean, we wanted to know if someone had a particular virus, um, and I think sometimes it's not well appreciated in technology circles that having lots more information is not necessarily that helpful in making clinical decisions and i think we see this with sequence data uh, and we see this in a number of settings and you know often a lot of clinical microbiology is trying to establish which bits of what you're finding are relevant to the clinical problem you're, you're facing and i suppose listening to adam i was i was thinking about this in the nursing home setting and i was hearing from him that he sees the, this as a barrier to adoption in some ways because it creates information that needs processing, that needs people, that needs infrastructure. But I, I was also thinking when I heard that as to whether we've learned enough lessons about the models of care. I mean, it struck me that both sort of automated algorithms, but also remote intervention could be used much more to try and interpret this and support people with diagnosis without a major infrastructure change, but I don't know whether people would agree with that. Anke, you're the, you're the clinician here. So what's your take on the, the complexity of handling multiple, you know, multiple pathogen data in the clinical setting? Yeah, it's a, I think it's a good question, Graham. And I think it comes down to, to, to the question of, well, what, how's it going to influence uh, clinical decision making? Um, and I, I think um, one of the things that has been really useful is that work that, that Massimo and, and other colleagues have done on mapping um, care pathways and, and decision making. And that's something I'd like to see um, going forward. It's something I'm using at the moment in some, um, I'm working with WHO developing some, some more TB, TBPs, and we've been looking at mapping care pathways and actually thinking um, about, well, our te tests are only really useful um, in my opinion, if if they can actually directly influence um, the management or decision making um, for a patient, so so going back to that, um, and again, you know, multiplexing is it, wonderful, or we might think it's wonderful if we can, you know, detect 
um, 10 organisms, but we have to have a think about, well, how, how are we going to use that information and how is that going to change patient care? Um, one of the questions um, we've, we've talked about this before, Graham, is, is on those multiplex kits with, with RSV, flu and, and COVID is, well, yeah, how are you, how are you going to be using that information? So particularly thinking about RSV in an adult um, when you're faced with that patient and those results in front of you. Um, and therefore, is it is it worth including in a in a in a panel? So I'm not sure if I've answered the question or just just created more questions. No, that's helpful. Does anyone else want to come in? I think I can see other clinicians and developers on the line. If 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 you want to come and, and chip in, um, there's a question I suppose related to that is 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 about how you design and choose what goes into a cartridge or a or a, or a multiplex, and you, Rashmita showed a number of new products, but you know I wasn't quite sure how you were arriving at both the choice of the product and um, and what was in it, and and what sort of process you're going through around that, and more importantly, why aren't you doing my monkeypox thing yet? No, we did it. <laughs> we did it. Um, we did monkeypox and uh, HSV one and two and um, uh, chickenpox. This is what you wanted, isn't it? Yeah. I have not started validating it yet. <laughs> That's why I, I don't have any clinical results to put it in. Whatever I've showed you, at least I have done that in clinical setup. You know? That's why I have some confidence that uh, it is in the in the right path. But um. Yeah, just to come to a stage that what makes us decide on a panel is usually either um, interest of clinicians or it's a immediate necessary. For example, COVID, as well as during the COVID, we have lots of variant, you know, it started coming Indian variant, South African variant, this and that. You won't believe we developed almost all of them in the lab. You know, I didn't present because I thought it fed out very quickly that it's no not long-term relevant to clinicians that... Uh, because the variant start coming every week and we are not able to change them off, you know, but at least six of them we try to identify. Within two weeks of time, we'll be able to identify a variant on the cartridge itself, you know. So, uh, but I think the decision like, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the Gramp uh, was mentioning about uh, monkeypox because it was his interest example and we try to develop that. So what makes us distinguish from a chickenpox to um, monkeypox as well HSP in that it was a clinician's decision that what panel will make them useful. So like that, whether I showed you STIs or I showed you the diabetic food panel, it is a combination of clinicians which are interested to see some kind of panel, whether it is only box target or including the resistance marker in that, you know, whether it is uh, gonorrhea plus gonorrhea resistance or uh, whether it is only diabetic food panel six box or with resistance marker. Usually we take clinicians input in that. We have a couple of discussions uh, and we come up with that a panel, small panel. But uh, once the panel is decided, we go for asset designing. Again, it is all with a bioinformatician um, help. And we do have a asset developer, a full team. Basically, literature-based targets, we will get it. You know, other, uh, we will look at the competitive markets, uh, what is available already there in the literature, and what are the targets. Example, in COVID time, we found CDC and uh, you know, so many other people have target started doing primer. We don't need to design them. We just adopt them. But in case of diabetic foot panel or in case of flu, flu, B, RSB, we will go through the literature best major targets and we choose between between two to 20 target, I would say. And sometimes we, we keep going till the cartridge development. You know, we have a different uh, struggle at different stages, but usually the assay part is easier. We can get it done to the PCR level. It's usually the challenge happens in the cartridge. You know, what assay brings you the most sensitive and specific in terms of cartridge point of view. And also the, when it goes to clinical samples, we have started to see sometimes that, you know, it behaves differently. So that is the entire process, but the easiest part is to, uh, the difficult, most difficult part is the panel, which panel to take it. And um, because we have only 72 and it is not like 72 direct we could do, we have to make it a compact panel so that we have some repeatance you know, on the target. So that makes it a bit harder for us. But yeah, it's, it's usually a standard asset development pattern apart from the struggle we have in the cutters till the end and yeah. everything goes back all the way another thing i must uh, mention here the stability point of view as well 
you know, when, when the product is ready on long-term stability also, it makes an impact. So these are some factors we consider from the beginning. Great. All right. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure. I can't see the chat very clearly. I don't know, Massimo, if you're there. We've talked a lot about the work you've done, and I don't know if you're there to talk, but um, it would be interesting to hear your reflections on some of the work, particularly of Condor. I suppose one of my concerns is that although Condor, you know, I think people won't mind me saying, I mean, it was sort of sort of came quite late in the response in a sense, but it did still manage to deliver some really quite useful things at scale. But as I understand it, that doesn't really have a funding future at the moment. Um, or if it does, I'm not sure what it is. So can anyone comment on that sort of infrastructure, which seemed really good, but I'm not sure we've got a really good sustainable model for to help us for next time? Um, well, I think you're right, Graham. I think um, we still are a network. We still have seven or eight centres, I think, that collaborated to give us a national network um, to evaluate things quickly, fairly in a fairly agile way. Um, we learned a lot from it in terms of the speed of uh, assessment, if you like, the speed of evaluation. We developed sort of futility tests because there were so many tests out there. We, we, we had very quick ways of saying, well, if it, if it fell over with 10 samples, we really weren't going to stick for the 120 samples or whatever or whatever it was that the um, that the power calps would suggest. And I, I think there is something about how we learn from that experience in terms of improving the speed of the pathway, as it were. And uh, anyone on the call that um, wants to contact the London in vitro diagnostic group afterwards or Graham or anyone, I'm sure we can point you in the right direction of how we might um, help you with that because, you know, anyone that's worked in diagnostics, you look at the development time from an innovation to a delivery of something, it tends to be pretty, pretty long, let's be honest. And I think we can do better with that. So that national network, um, I think, helped us understand how we could do that with confidence. And I think that is a legacy from that which we'll all take forward in terms of whether or not we can actually convince people to fund, as it were, sort of almost like a sleeping platform ready to to kick off for the next time, as you had with some of the therapies. And uh, I, I know that the kind of inquiry into COVID is just kicking off, but I, I'd like to think that we can look at it from a point of view of being one of the kind of leading biomedical centers in the world, um, how we might do that better were it to happen again and what were the lessons learned. And I think if it does mean that we continue to fund this kind of knowledge base, um, I can see Ashley's on the call as well. So um, I think there is the potential there, but it would need a lot of lobbying, I think, to get it funded properly, Graham. That's why that's a bit long with no, that's good. I think um, it would be nice to get into the inquiry and, and what we wanted to find, but I probably haven't got time for that. Um, actually, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, yeah. I was I was involved in Condor from the Newcastle yeah. perspective, and I think um, I'd ref, you know echo everything Peter has just said then. And I, th I think one of the things we learned, of course, and it, we kind of knew, didn't we, that, that diagnostics would be a crucial part of the beginning of a pandemic. We don't have any treatments. All we have is infection control at the beginning. And the only way we can implement good infection control in hospitals is by knowing who, which patients have got the disease and which don't. And so I think, you know, th th this, this idea of having some kind of sleeper that, that can be activated very quickly and also keeping those networks going is actually quite vital. And I, I think we need some way of, as this piece says, of lobbying to make sure that that something continues from all that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, sorry, go yeah. on. No, 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 that's the point. Yeah. No, I think I, at the start, I think I said, I, I was also saying that I think diagnostics are often neglected in the conversations. And I think from where I said, I see it dropping out of conversation quite quickly too. And I mean, I'm, I'm mindful of some of the preparation committees that that sit at DH and, you know, had a remit around PPE and a remit around antivirals, but no real remit around diagnostics as far as I could see. And I think that's keeping this in the conversation the whole time is, is really important. Um, Massimo, sorry, I invited you in and then I ignored you, but did you want to come in on, um, on Condor? Yeah, thank you, Graham. So, um, uh, echoing what, what Peter just said, um, it's quite important to understand that the activities that we, we were involved in for Condo, they gave us the opportunity to design a, a rapid evaluation, a rapid usability evaluation or diagnostic test. Um, and this methodology, it's, 
specific for for the condo the, the condo project but um it gave us the chance to um assess test simultaneously for just three or four weeks time that is absolutely unusual for a human factors evaluation that might take uh, quite a long time and it's important to say that this methodology that we are validating uh, it's giving us the opportunity to scope out the potential usability issues so we might um, squeeze a little bit uh, uh, and extend the methodology to understand if we have some potential um, usability issues that we want to further understand. So we have scope for a lot of activities in that limited amount of time. And what you saw uh, in the presentation from Adam, um, the um, different tests that we, we had the chance to evaluate, uh, all those uh, evaluations were uh, conducted remotely. So in a situation that was completely, again, unusual, and we were able to spot um, some concerns, some usability uh, concerns that um, were critical at that time. So it's quite important that we take into consideration the usability aspect and the understanding of the pathway um, in the development stage of diagnostic test, even though we don't have uh, enough time, even though we don't have enough funding, we'll find a way to apply validated methodologies uh, within, the, um, within the time frame of each project. So it's quite important that we, um, we um, keep discussing about the potential opportunities we have. And it wasn't easy at all to conduct usability evaluation remotely with care homes. And in certain situations, we were just adding extra burden on care homes. Um, it wasn't easy at all, but we managed to find the right methodology. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I think probably we're about to wrap up. I, I will offer a final thought or word to anybody who wants to seize it. If you want to, just put your hand up and, and say. Um, but if not, then I think, first of all, thank you very much again to Naoko and, and the team at the IVD Cooperative for uh, initiating this sorting it out hi uh, and and thank you for for all your all your planning thank you to all of our speakers i think have given a really nice broad view on many aspects of, of what we're all trying to grapple with in terms of, of diagnostics um thank you to everybody for coming and I, I hope we've achieved what we tried to do which was to to start a conversation hopefully make some connections uh, and and have um the seeds of new projects that can go forward as well as trying to establish how we keep the the current ones on the road, um, which will be for another day too. But um, with that, thank you very much. And um, hopefully we can arrange something again in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.